This is Yojo Senki, The Saga of Tanya the Evil, Volume 2, Plus Ultra, Chapter 5, The Devil of the Rhine. We begin with a quote. A shovel is an implement born of civilization. Hooray for civilization. Quotation from Tanya von Degrichaf, Analects of a Rhine Front Commander which is itself, I believe, a probably a reference to Infantry Gereft An by um, the Desert Fox himself. <laughs> anyway, continuing. Present day, as well as somewhere in March of Unified Year 1925. It is a familiar dream for the old man who lived through the Rhine. He would have the same dream again tonight, as one of the soldiers who served in the Great War. It is all burned deep into his mind. Back then, back there, in a way, it is where the rest of their lives were forged. Even now, unceasing gunfire echoes in his head like a broken record. Before he knows it, his thoughts return to that battlefield full of memories. Even after the war, the sights and sounds are too raw in their minds to fade. It is the past, but they can remember that world so clearly. The fucking battlefield. The most horrible things the human race ever created. That battlefield where mud and flies reigned. Ah, he groans at the recollection. The Rhine was the very gates of hell. The old man had that dream over and over. And it, remind, and it reminded again and again, it should be reminded him again and again, there's a typo there. <clears throat> I'll probably never forget it. I remember the events of that day in great detail. As shells crisscrossed just over our heads, me and the rest of Company G were steadily advancing under orders to move to a new attack position. Of the five regiments composing the front line, Company E was seeing the most intense fighting, and our mission was to support their flank. I was in a machine gun squad. Our job was simply to get up the guns at the trench dug by the vanguard unit and create a firing position. The Imperial Army was supposed to have the Republican Army pretty well suppressed in that area. But the lines themselves were complicated as always. They were almost fluid in nature. In other words, the battlefield was a bloody, chaotic jumble of us and them. The bombardment had blown away all but one tree in this quagmire, the sort of place where resources were wasted, blood ran in rivers, and where you would peek out of the trench to see what you could see. It would be all artillery smoke. Still, the blasted enemy artillerymen made nothing of the awful visibility and shelled us constantly at a, varying pay, at a varying pace. Our company's trench mortar squad returned fire, but they barely made a dent in them. Despite the smoke obscuring the battlefield, we could see a number of muzzle flashes from the Republican army positions. I remember how much we struggled with the mortars. They didn't have a stable place to shoot from because the duckboards were sinking into the mud. Conditions were so bad that for the machine guns too, even the highly trained gunners couldn't control their lines of fire. I remember that as far as the eye could see, it was soldiers covered in mud, doing everything within human power to secure their attack positions. I remember that day very well indeed. The field guns set up in the trench were trying out some observed fire, and the de designated riflemen were digging foxholes with all their might. Looking back on it now, they were supermen. They, these were superhuman actions from the few who stepped up in one corner of the harsh battlefield, not allowing themselves to be discouraged by the maggots, the muck, or the shells raining down enveloping everyone in the stenches of rot and death with no decent cover, those men advanced through the mud. They had trench foot. Their display of bravery is burned into my eyelids, and it, ev and it even appeared divine in nature. 
I respect those men to this day from the bottom of my heart, and shall continue to do so till my dying breath. It was a shocking picture from a world you can't understand unless you've experienced it yourself. You can only understand by being there. I can't believe this. Those toads. They must really like the mud. <laughs> yeah, the gunners wanted to turn this land into a swamp and jump right in. But the ones getting shot at are Company H, and I feel for them. Not that I can really help them any in the current circumstances. The team's banter eased our nerves somewhat, but the chatter from the guys in a nearby foxhole reminded us of reality. The ones under fire were Company H, who had gone on ahead of us. Frustratingly, the brass at the time seemed convinced we could break through the enemy's defense with human bullets. I think they mean human shields. <laughs> How many lives do they think this muddy tract of land is worth? Air support still isn't here? Fuck! Shut up the enemy's guns already! Someone let out a groan that echoed the sentiments of the whole company. We were supposed to push the lines up in places under local air superiority. I think they mean localized air superiority. That's how the operation was supposed to work. Those despicable bigwigs said we could have a complete air support. But we wanted to scream that they must have meant a complete lack of air support, the fucking bastards. I told you, didn't I? You can bet your Easter turkey that was an empty promise on their part. High explosives crisscrossed over the battlefield. A near hit from one of those was enough to blow a human body to pieces. In a situation like that, close, full support was a pipe dream. So I don't think we were expecting much in the first place. Regardless of how the new recruits rushed through training felt, the old hands knew all too well that there was no promise less reliable than one made by the top brass. Everyone ended up like that in due time. The soldiers exposed to the squall of heavy shelling, faced with the inescapable pain and mental strain of long hours under fire, couldn't help their eternal skepticism. If they didn't, gruesome reality would slay the beautiful propaganda in a single blow and the soldiers would go insane. In order to survive the horrific war, you couldn't rely too much on hope. Ah, I'm hit! Damn it! Medic! Medic! I remember being able to hear, for some reason, the sounds of someone in a neighboring dugout crumpling to the ground and their friends panicking. Even over the roar of the battlefield, I suddenly realized that one unlucky bastard had been done in by a stray shot or a sniper. Since the entire trench wasn't blown away and there were no follow-up shots, it had to be a sniper. We quickly ducked lower and sprayed harassing fire anywhere it seemed like he could have been lurking. We don't want to die here. Send over a stretcher. Cover them. Then... I'll never forget those four stretcher bearers racing out under diligent cover to try to get to their injured brother to the rear to try to get their injured brother to the rear. Emblems of courage and integrity. The medics are the only ones those of us headed away from the battlefield can rely on, because the medics, called Sanis, were with us. We were guaranteed some humanity in that hellish world. Unlike people working easier jobs in the rear, if there was a fellow soldier who needed them, they would always charge into hails of bullets and gunfire even we would balk at. Even when they were blown away with a painful impact, more of them were ready to go out after their fallen teammates. It was proof of their courage. They were the only ones I really deeply respected out here. They were the only ones we could trust no matter what. I still feel that way to this day. Lay down a smoke screen. Hand grenades. Throw everything you've got. The mortar squad shot smoke shells. The designated riflemen threw grenades, and we just put up a curtain of fire. The stretchers the stretcher was a sight for sore eyes when it safely appeared. Our trustworthy friends with their magnificent bravery. Sanis had to be protected if no one else. They were the only ones who would save us. At the same time, I guess you could say, 
due to the covering fire, the Republicans spread out across from us seemed to remember the targets they were supposed to prioritize. They were determined to crush not the swiftly receding stretcher, but the smart aleck machine gun nets. Thanks to that, we were showered in concentrated fire, and I lowered my head without thinking, unable to take all the blasts of dust filling the air from near hits. Face down in our trench, with our ears alert, we smiled weakly at the thought of how many Republican artillerymen must be treating us to shells. But that strange calm only lasted so long. After the whiz of something cutting through the air came a big, heavy boom we weren't used to. It sent chills up our spines. Those weren't 128 millimeter shells. They'd brought out their precision 100, sorry, their precise, uh, their precious 180 millimeter field guns. So that's 1.8 centimeters diameter, or no, 18 centimeters diameter on those shells. Holy shit. Listen up, troops. Friendly reinforcements are on their way. Let's stick this out. At that moment, we were happy for instructions over the radio from our battalion commander. But our sense of futility was greater still. Our battalion had no shortage of replacement troops. We had nearly lost our will to fight, so I guess they were throwing us a line to cling to. Maybe that line would work on guys who didn't know how unreliable it was. But we understood all too well how that illusion would hold up. So when, the, so when the hell is that support unit getting here? Someone on the machine gun crew expressed what all of us who knew the battlefield were thinking. We really needed reinforcements. The way it was going, we figured we would all have to die defending that quagmire and lie covered in this muck. So we really wanted backup as soon as possible. I want reinforcements, preferably before I die. Was it me who murmured it, or the fellow next to me? To this day, I still don't know, but I'm sure someone did. That was when the nearby radio operator started shouting at the top of his lungs. The operators were the guys monitoring enemy transmissions, making sure they didn't pinpoint us. Usually, they were full of bad news, but later I would think over and over how sometimes they did have something good for us. Reinforcements! The reinforcements are here! I remembered very well how people thought the operator was shell-shocked and sent him pitying looks, but then we saw something we could hardly believe, so there was no time to think about that. Or rather, we heard it. O oh, father, oh, fatherland, my love, be at peace. On every channel, over a wide area, the words were broadcast so powerfully even a regular soldier with no magical ability could hear them. Clouds of dust were blackening the sky, and the mud seemed to be swallowing up everything on the battlefield. But the voice that rang out over the chaos was surprisingly calm. It was no wonder we questioned for a moment whether we had gone crazy as well. The phenomenon seemed that surreal. It was the code for a unit of reinforcements. We cocked our heads, thinking the backup couldn't possibly be real, that it had to be an auditory hallucination. O oh, fatherland, my love, be at peace. But we weren't hearing things, and we weren't crazy. Not this time. Someone was really repeating those words in the official language of the Empire, and it was the single-use word to show they were friend and not foe at that. Guardians of the Rhine, ye are loyal, ye are rocks, ye are loyal, ye are rocks. That's, I believe, a biblical reference as well, like the whole uh, Peter in the Bible, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Okay, so they're basically saying, yes, you are the rocks, the foundation stones of our nation's national defense. Glorious. Okay, continuing. The operator boosts the signal to the highest output possible, and the answers from the radio dugout was the happiest sound I'd ever heard. The stream of words coming out of the machine gun squad's radio will be forever carved into my eardrums. 
We always laughed at what silly codes they'd come up with. The radio operators especially would make fun of them. But this time, just this once, I think all of us were truly consoled by them. The widespread interference only mages could employ. It could only be mages. It could only have been the elite mages of the Imperial Army here to save us. So it is lucky they didn't know that their saviors, their reinforcements, were hazardous, could bring utter destruction to their allies as well. She was supposed to be on she was supposedly on their side, but even the Imperial Army brass treated her as a god of death. It was a battalion for war nuts made by war nuts, and they had arrived on this battlefield. Slicing through the haze of clouds and gun smoke, she bristles with nerves. Major Tanya von Degrichaf, internally sick of this, externally expressionless, is leading her response unit to the Rhine Air Defense Identification Zone, Sector D5. Code confirmed. This is the 203rd Aerial Mage Battalion, call sign Pixie. We are en route, arriving in 160 seconds. Tanya isn't particularly keen on trench warfare. The only job I hate more is turning on the charm for propaganda. After all, now that I've been turned into a girl, I'm faced with this annoying military framework where men are inherently superior. Just the thought of my promotions being blocked by an invisible glass ceiling is enough to dampen any desire I might have to act all girlish for propaganda. Trench warfare, on the other hand, is just too dangerous. The return on investment is far too low. Apart from that, the Empire's personnel system has adapted extremely meritocratic principles for the war. In a way, so I'm more or less satisfied with it. So even though hugging every contour of the land to maintain the lowest possible altitude as she speeds towards the battlefield is dangerous, she is satisfied because at least she'll be valued for her valiant efforts. With that said, she is, com she is in command of a mission to cross an area littered with spent shells and assault the enemy artillery position with gun smoke curling high into the air. Even if it came with hazard and war zone pay, it didn't feel great. Troops, you'll be performing support combat. Ready anti-surface ordnance, diffusion explosion formulas, optical deception formulas, and counter-bullet outer shells. Take on counter-air and mage flights as you like. Gr gripping her rifle and computation orb tightly, Tanya gives the necessary instructions in a matter-of-fact tone. Supporting combat is actually a pain for commanders. Bombing the wrong side is unforgivable. If we blow away our own troops, next will be a shower of bullets from the firing positions on the ground. No question. The trenches and positions are built in such a way as to limit damage. But even so, no one is happy to be blown up by accident. Only the United States of America is allowed to accidentally bomb whoever the hell they want. That's, that is that is they somehow get enough leeway to, oops, bomb the Chinese embassy in Belgrade makes me jealous in a way. When the fuck did the Americans bomb the Bel embassy in Belgrade? Um, they're making a reference here that really should have an editor's note. That was probably the war in Kosovo. Because Belgrade's awfully close to there. Yeah, that would have been the Yugoslav Wars. Yeah, I'm guessing that was probably it. Yeah, the breakup of Yugoslavia. As I understand it, the Americans still have bases in Kosovo. <laughs> American Empire. Anyway, continuing. Setting those thoughts aside, the only viable option for this support mission is to swoop in close to the enemy position and go to town. In that case, the best plan is to maintain as high a speed and low an altitude as possible, and invade all at once in a sneak attack. But that's theory. The ones actually maintaining that speed and altitude are already fed up. No one will tell you that flying fast near the ground is comfortable. Because it isn't. Not by any means. Although this allowed me to escape the trouble surrounding the sinking of the Commonwealth submarine 
Getting sent to the Rhine front was bad luck. CP, this is Pixie. Send the target. Roger, Pixie. Take out the enemy artillery emplacements pummeling G and H companies. Understood. I'd like to request five minutes of supporting suppressive fire starting now. We'll get them during that time. Still, I'm glad that on this type of arena, Tanya's managed to retain the measure of autonomy that naturally comes with being a Silver Wings Assault Badge recipient. For starters, I can choose my targets freely. And the rear base may not have been perfectly tidy, but it was way better than getting all muddy and being ordered to defend a position and end up the target of a barrage in the confusion. The place just barely counts as a rear base, though. The meals aren't the standard portable trench rations, but proper hot food. On top of that, if I may broach an indelicate topic, the waste management situation is also considerably better. It is only our first spring. If the air when I'm flying low reeks this badly, I can only imagine they are, going, they are doing the exact opposite of what hygiene dictates. As the cultured man with a common-sense grasp of hygiene, I was before the trenches, becoming a little girl and having... Sorry, fuck. As the cultured man with a common-sense grasp of hygiene I was before trenches, becoming a little girl and what have you, I can only say it is difficult... It is a difficult environment to withstand. Okay, that is a very complex sentence. It is about as bad as being aboard a submarine sinking into an out-of-order toilet. Yeesh. Instead of that, I have more... I have work commensurate with my pay, striking field guns with their feeble anti-air fire from the sky. And as long as there are no intercepting mages, we'll just be duck hunting. They'll be great targets. I want to rack up as many accomplishments as I can and fulfill the requirements for leave. I may be here as punishment, but if nothing's on paper, I must be allowed to exercise my rights. I want to hurry up and get transferred to the rear to find a safe post. Five minutes? That won't even suppress the anti-air fire, much less the artillery. After all, even a strike mission, which is comparatively safe for the front line, forces you to run some pretty lousy risks. For example, the observation squad is going out of their way, volunteering, you might say, to support us. If the frontline observers are acting as guides for us, then that has to mean the situation is less than ideal. Usually, the observers would be out there spotting impacts. If they have time to kill, it must mean our side doesn't have much artillery to spare. If we deploy our mages' outer shells at full power and fly in anti-service assault formation, there's no way we'll get shot by our own, at least. If by some miraculous chance we suffer direct hits, we should be able to escape fatal injury thanks to the new orb model. More importantly, defense from, air, uh, defense from artillery is drilled into everyone in boot camp. That's no problem, and don't worry about us. Keep firing after we go in. After all, keeping an eye out overhead is the commander's job in an anti-surface assault. Having one unit strike while another unit provides air cover is a basic necessity in an air battle. Yeah, I am sure I don't need to explain that if I fly with direct support, the danger of getting caught in a barrage lessens to an incredible degree. Plus, I can finally increase my altitude. Escaping that sticky, thick air even feels a little nice. Hmm. Anyhow, leaving the smell and the danger zone is enough to improve Major von Degrichaf's mood. Lieutenant Sabrebrikov. We are getting five minutes of supporting fire. After all the artillery shells dr shelling drills we did, I don't believe there's any numbskulls in my battalion who would take a friendly shell to the head. Understood, ma'am. Frankly, it still feels weird to be call uh, to call me. To, fuck. Frankly, it still feels weird to call my being quote unquote she. But anyhow, this little girl is wearing a rare smile. She pays no mind to the rather strained quality of the reply, 
and noting that it is time for work, cheerfully starts on an upward trajectory. Since we'll be attacking the ground, we don't have to climb to freezing cold temperatures. Another plus. As a result, Major von Degrichaf is decidedly chipper. Her expression even relaxes into a grin. And that scene is carved into the minds of the former soldier, sorry, and that scene is carved into the mind of the former soldier who was there watching it. How many years has it been since the war? Yet his memories of the time are still clear as day. Pleasantly surprised by the news of reinforcements, we figured things would work out somehow. That said, the threat level we were facing might have dropped a bit, but lowering our guard as well would see us turned into silent corpses. So our company used the little extra time we'd been given wisely. The dead were moved aside, and stretchers were prepared for the wounded. And the machine guns had just worn out, so we arranged to swap in replacement barrels. Yes, quick change barrels for the machine guns. Good move. To our dismay, however, although they had plenty of the all-important barrels, apparently logistics was too understaffed to deliver them to the firing line in the middle of a large-scale battle. When they told my team to send someone, I was called upon to settle my tab from that ritual both traditional and sacred known as cards. In other words, you owe us. Come to think of it, I think the cards hated me back then. Or I just couldn't see through the clever cheating of my company mates. It pains me that now I have no way of knowing. But at that time, those things weren't even a dream in my mind as I set off grumbling and crawling to the base dugout. There, I negotiated with the formidable logistics NCO, that's non-commissioned officer, and ended up stuck carrying the parts. <laughs> People tend to have this misunderstanding that it was safe in the rear, but on the Rhine front at that time, safety was a fantasy. The closest distance between firing lines was only a few dozen meters. I wish I had been staring down the enemy in one of those. Since the trenches were so close together, the risk of accidentally hitting friendlies was high, so they couldn't usually conduct bombardments. Even if that wasn't their situation, artillerymen apparently hated firing into dangerous areas where they might lay waste to their own along with the enemy. Whether Empire or Republic, we all had the common desire to avoid blowing up our fellow men. At least amongst our own troops, that is. Rather than drop high explosives on our own positions, shoot for the enemy, even if you miss. Such was the mantra of the day. It was common sense for both armies, so if you watched out for snipers, landmines, and rifles on the forwardmost line, you weren't likely to be an instant fatality. But I should probably add that it wasn't rare for artillery to mistake the position of the front line or to have trouble telling friend from foe in the confusion. I was once in a position nearly overrun by the Republican army, and I saw all the invading soldiers get wiped out in an instant by Republican army shells. Their friendly fire did the work for us. Our respectful nomination of the enemy artillery for the field artillery badge made it into the official gazette as a bit of a gag. <laughs> We applaud the Republican artillery's great demonstration of their training and contribution to the Imperial War effort. That is the kind of battlefield we were dealing with, but there was only one reason the rear was considered the most dangerous place to be. It's the radios. Any strong waves that aren't your own are obviously enemy command or a base dugout. It doesn't take even two days to crush a newbie's delusions of safety because of our sturdy underground fortifications. If you can't achieve much firing on the front line, then aim a storm of steel at the communications apparatus you can find. Or so the thinking goes. If heavy armor-piercing rounds hit, dugouts are practically meaningless. You're holed up in a cellar one minute, and then the next, you've been plowed, you are being plowed by artillery shells. The end. A suffocating death under a collapsed trench would be dreadful. 
nobody was eager to set foot in a radio dugout. At the same time, they were so dangerous it was taboo to keep the communications base in the same dugout for more than 48 hours. Nobody talked about it, but everyone avoided doing it. The reason radios were brought to the front line despite those conditions was that we needed them, desperately. You can't keep something as big as an army together with semaphores and trumpets alone. Wireless technology has proved effective amid the fog of war, so it's no wonder armies continue to depend on it, even now. Just to break from the story for a moment, I might add, in World War I, in real life, as I understand it, they actually used um, Morse code from uh, wire transmissions. I, what, God, what the hell do you call those things? Um, in any case, I forget exactly what they're called offhand. Um, uh, anyway, I can't remember. But the point is, they basically would send communications by wire instead of by wireless, to partially to avoid this, and also because the radios at the time were not actually advanced enough to be very effective, very short range, and yes, fairly easy to intercept as well. So, yeah, by having wired lines, they managed to avoid being traced and having issues like that. Of course, if someone shells the area behind your line, they can puncture the wires, which is why they would actually have guys who'd basically go out into the trenches to try and re-establish direct lines with actual cable for all the good that did them. Anyway, continuing here. Wireless technology has proved effective amidst the fog of war, so it is no wonder armies continue to depend on it, even now. And listening in on the flood of messages was second nature to not only the radio operators, but also the rumor-starved soldiers in the trenches. That is why I was keeping my ears open by habit and heard it. Something so unbelievable, I wondered if the fray had ruined my ears. There aren't any numbskulls in my unit who would get hit by a friendly shell. We need to prioritize keeping the enemy under control and holding them back above all else. A commander asking for a bombardment to be shot over them? I was about to shake my head, thinking there must have been some sort of mistake when CP to Pixie 01. These are high explosive shells with fuses timed for airburst. Surely you know that. Pixie 01, Roger. That's fine. Commence the attack. Despite the static, I could tell she sounded cheerful. I'm still confident in my hearing ability, even at this age. But that time was the one and only occasion that I didn't trust it. She sounded so excited. Her tone was light-hearted, but her message was utterly disturbing. What I heard over that radio was definitely the voice of someone having fun. She thought nothing of a direct hit from an airburst. She wasn't worried about shrapnel coming down like rain. What madness. Without thinking, the NCO I didn't even know and I looked at each other. We had to make our artillery sorry, we had to make our artillerymen bombard our own mages? I couldn't believe it. I was awestruck. If they hit them, there would be hell to pay. Even if they were forgiven, they would have killed their own. Is she serious? Surely she can't be. Why do the mages listen to her? But either God is a piece of shit, or he has some far-sighted design us lambs can't even begin to imagine. She was deadly serious. In the case of Friendly Fire, it was impossible to tell which emplacement had hit the wrong target, so incidents were handled with silence. They were unfortunate accidents, and no one said a word. But it's a different story if the artillery is executing an observed fire mission on an area with our troops in it. Their reputation would be ruined. No one would forgive firing on our own troops, even if it was a direct order. Major, do you... Don't worry about us. Continue the bombardment. Even more invigorated, it scared me that such good cheer was coming over the radio. No, even now, I'm not sure exactly what I was scared of. The fear of being shelled for hours on end, holed up in a trench praying to make it through. The terror and the urge to scream at the top of your lungs. Just put me out of my misery, dear lord. 
Only someone who has experienced that horror could possibly understand it. There was something strange about someone who could laugh off the fear of a bombardment. <laughs> I wasn't this scared, even when the sniper was aiming at us. I was stone cold. It felt like my body was frozen to the core. What the hell is this chill? Pixie 03 to Pixie 01, detecting, mu detecting multiple mana signals. Two company-sized groups of enemy mages are on their way up. Time to contact is 600. That would be 600 seconds. I remember then that the warning someone issued brought me back to myself, and the radio operator frantically re relayed the enemy info to other stations. It was either just a new enemy unit or an intercepting unit. Even so, that was daily life on the Rhine lines, so I felt a strange happiness at returning to the normal from such an, uh, such an anomaly. I remember that I had to take the replacement parts and ammunition and return to the firing line. I had to get back while the communication trench was relatively tranquil, so it must have been about that time that I thanked the NCO, grabbed my stuff, and was about to set off running. And that's got a question mark there, not a period. So I can only assume that the guy who's recounting this is like asking a question of his own memory because he's not certain. Okay. I definitely heard the click of a tongue and a sigh over the radio. <sighs> the same radio that a cheerful voice had been coming from until a moment ago. First company, prepare for counter-mage combat. Follow me. These idiots don't have an appointment, so we are going to beat them back. The rest of you, on the artillery. Finish that quick, and join up with us. The spirit in her words was like a blizzard. You didn't know that spirits... Sorry, you don't know that spirits can dwell in words? It's a pretty well-known topic on the battlefield, but... Well... It's probably better not to know such things. Maybe it'll be easier to understand if I say it was like the devil reading prophetic writing at random. In other words, chaos. Pixie 01 to CP. We'll meet the incoming mage units, the incoming enemy mage units, but no changes to the original plan. You don't have to watch out for air combat. Normally, that would be condescending and overconfident, the ones under that commander must have been un unlucky. But when I replay the memories in my mind, I can't help but shout, You monster! A hero, a star, an outstanding magic officer. You, ma'am, were a great officer. To all of us Imperial soldiers serving on the Rhine lines, you were a god. A new commander with a lot of mana and not much else? She must have a death wish. Unfortunately, whoever uttered that comment is no longer alive. Pixies? I'm pretty sure I heard of them from some great army guys. They said she was a god of death. The rumors from those guys who thought they knew a bit about Major von Degrichaf were true. Yeah, she's a god, all right. An immensely powerful one who presides over life and death. Things are getting fun now, troops. You're having fun, surely, right? Her words, brimming with a spine-chilling anger, swept over the area as if she was planning to attack all the enemy's hostility like moths to a flame. Major von Degrichaf had bared her fangs. It invited a violent reaction. The Republic wants to hunt the devil. In other words, they devoted all humanity's wisdom to killing the god of death. Gods don't die, you see, but those of us next to them? Hmm, that's another matter. They were right to call her a god of death. She killed the enemy, and the enemy killed our men. Then the noble major, with a glance at all the dead in the muck, took her leave. Fucking hell. <laughs> February 24th, Unified Year, 1925 A.D., the suburbs of Berun, Imperial Army Military Court. Tanya would tell you that an army, at the end of the day, is a state's instrument of violence. 
No matter what rhetorical flourishes are employed, its fundamental nature does not change. Those who get indignant and ask, what do you mean, instrument of violence, either don't understand the military or do understand voters. It's either one or the other. Either way, regardless of the definition, the army must be controlled. They must kowtow to the leaders of the state. Thus, regardless of how trustworthy those making up the organization are, they must be put on a leash. The emperor's army, protectors of the empire, vanguard of the people, shield of the nation, even the imperial army show, uh, show, showered with such praise is no exception. Imperial subjects are proud of their soldiers. That is why deviating from that ideal inspires such reproach. The imperial military, as one of its standards, desires all officers and men to be model citizens. These expectations apply across the board, even to lowly privates. A natural consequence of this is that proper conduct is demanded of honorable officers with special emphasis. In a way, during peacetime, it is even more important that your cal uh, than your caliber as a soldier. As a result, the military authorities have a maniacal love for rules, meaning they have a court-martial waiting for you if you break one. As a class in society, military officers are ashamed of being court-martialed, but that is during peacetime. The peaceful era of prioritizing honor and worshiping causes is over. Now we are at war. The matters dealt with in military courts, too, become issues of whether you unflinchingly carried out your duty or not. So, according to military logic, it is difficult to overlook that this was an officer just doing their duty who got mixed up in an international political debacle and brought about by improperly maintained legislation. On the other hand, in a foreign affairs sense, a few of the high-ranking officers and most of the diplomats are pulling their hair out. Please consider the politics, they demanded. You intend to make an officer who did her duty a scapegoat, comes the retort. The combination of these viewpoints makes for a volatile courtroom atmosphere. There we find the governance of a trial according to law. Major von Degrichaf, this court is dismissing your case. The legal specialist acting as the judge stands and reads the decision. Amidst a forest of thorns forming from the gazes of uniforms and suits alike, they're throwing out my case, which is to say, this compromise lets them avoid having to reject the claim by saying there is no reason to make one. They are getting around making a judicial call by saying that the case doesn't technically meet the criteria to be considered in the first place. The acting judge can do nothing but read the paper in his hands with an expression like a Francosman, a, a Francos, a, a Frenchman, a Frenchman. At any, at any rate, they, they spell it as Francosman, who has been served the best Albion cuisine in the world three nights in a row. They need to save face on both sides, but if the positions are in mark, marked uh, contradiction. Supp supplantation is the answer. In other words, shelving the case is the only logical choice. Or perhaps I should, they should say only amiable choice. The attack on and sinking of the neutral country's vessel was an unfortunate accident. But by adding that extra bit at the end, he is able to express his regret about the affair. It is clear to all seated in the courtroom that the presiding legal officer inserted the line to absorb some of the shock. To Tanya, this is the reconciliation she was expecting. She knows that someone who is faithful to the logic of the organization is in no danger of being disciplined unless they do something to harm the whole. And the group from the foreign office has been prepared for that decision as well. They went in with the gloomy thought that the army would probably not give them the decision they wanted, but they understood on a fundamental level. 
Not that understanding does anything to soften the looks they are sending Tanya's way from their seats in the gallery, with fists clenched. Meanwhile, as Tanya, I feel that receiving these murderous stares as if she's killed their parents was rather unfair. Of course, I understand what the foreign office guys think. They very badly want a scapegoat to appease public opinion in the Commonwealth. For better or worse, because the foreign office types value the entire state, they apparently don't consider an individual's interests with the same framework as the national concerns. Well, that is truly annoying. Tanya wants to sigh, but seeing as they are already seething internally, she figures keeping her mouth shut is the smarter plan, and remains silent. It is a grave truth that international relations have been harmed by this incident, but in light of both, pre pre of both pre precedent and laws and regulations, although it is our moral obligation to a debate Major von Degrichaf's negligence, we find that in terms of legal authority, the matter lies outside of our jurisdiction. The statement he reads is, in a way, declaring an ambiguous position. While speaking of moral obligation and whatnot, they indicate, in a roundabout way, that they intend to evade responsibility via the bureaucratic reply that the matter doesn't fall under their legal authority. That said, Tanya is not the only one who can understand that to not judge her means the same thing as to not blame her. In addition, Having taken into account the lawful nature of the mandate Major von Degrichaf was given, we acknowledge that at the same time she had very little room for discretion and that she acted in faithful accordance with her orders. In any event, however, we dismiss the case. But it seemed like the general staff or someone at the top put pressure on them. Even to Tanya, that last bit on the conclusion was a strangely favorable addition. She grins openly. Without realizing it, her glossy lips have twisted into a faint smile. With this, she is as good as innocent. But in the courtroom, the only one looking so cheerful is the girl at the center of it all. Among a majority of people who are, willful, are willfully suppressing their expressions, the smiling defendant can't help but draw attention all the more so because the happy face belongs to Major von Degrichaf, who is rumored to have rather emotionless features. For the aforementioned reasons, we lift Major von Degrichaf's detention order. All those involved think it best not to mention that she wasn't ever under one. That said, confronted with her smile, many of the attendees fret and wonder if this was really the right thing to do. But the decision has already been made, and the superior mage the front lines want so badly will be released from custody, exactly as the general staff expected. The Rhine lines call for urgency. Having a usable mage detained due to a political issue would be intolerable under these conditions. They can prioritize the allotment of shells and other supplies to the great army, but not mages? <laughs> If they could fight the war like that, then no one would have to worry. Give us more mages, even just one more. When wailing on when wailing on it, it looks like entrees, but it's not entre entreaties entreat on or maybe it is entrees. When wailing entreaties like that are coming in from the front lines, the general staff don't have the resources anywhere to let a decorated named just loaf about. Okay, uh, that word in the previous sentence has got to be a typo of something. I don't know what it means. And how would they? If they have had such resources, sorry, if they had had such resources, the war would surely have been decided a long time ago. We need her on the Rhine. It can't be helped. For those sort of reasons alone, the matter was decided from the start. Well, no. If she had actually been negligent, things might have been very different. Those are the only reasons. 
She is proud and visibly relieved that her previous judgment has proven correct. According to the rules of military and international law, I threatened a submarine of unknown nationality that was either violating or deviating from established standards. Though unfortunate, the accident was caused by warning shots fired according to procedures that were not created with submarines in mind. If there had been even one mistake in execution, the diplomats probably could have gotten the heavy punishment they wanted so very dearly. But when there wasn't a single error, well, that's right. If there are no grounds for a sacrifice, what do you think will happen? If they were going to force through disciplinary action on me under such circumstances, this would turn into a scandal involving everyone from the Ministry of the Interior, and the people from the Army and Navy who drafted the rules to members of the Foreign Office. My most significant military achievement has been to complicate things. I am a promising mage and a recipient of the Silver Wings Assault Badge. In other words, they can't afford to cut me off. And Tanya's analysis has proven correct. The Army's Railroad Department, the Service Corps, operations in the General Staff, and even the Technology Division had been putting pressure, albeit informally, on the legal officers. The person in charge of practical matters in each department had gone directly and hinted that they were deeply concerned that an outstanding officer's reputation might be ruined. It was probably so much pressure it gave the legal officers stomach aches. I am so important that multiple departments came together to protect me. Not that anyone made direct threats, mind you, but the expectations multiple military organizations have for me put an awful lot of pressure on the legal officers not to disappoint them. So the legal specialist's hard-won achievement was showing that they were ready to court-martial me and deliberate. I can say that's a job well done on their part. But that is only an internal matter. Someone within the organization may have resisted, but to an outsider, the end result won't look any different. And that's all that matters at this juncture. Of course, in terms of international law, the matter between the Empire and the Commonwealth is officially settled. It was an unfortunate accident, nothing more. The deal is that the Empire expresses their regret. More uh, uh, conversely, the Commonwealth makes an announcement to the effect that they hope this will be prevented going forward. And there ensues some finger-pointing wherein each lays most of the blame on the other. But that's between the diplomats. I highly doubt the people will accept that just because will accept that just because the government does. The Commonwealth's public is furious that one of their warships was sunk and people died as a result. They have no reason to bury the hatchet so easily. On top of that, and I'll say it without mincing words, Commonwealth authorities are happily inciting such opinions in preparations for war. The atrocious Imperial Army they say. For someone who knows their geopolitics, their actions are actually natural. It's obvious what would happen if the Empire defeated all of its opposition on the continent. Having to face one giant country would have, been, would have to be a nightmare. So if the people aren't on board with fighting the war, there's nothing strange about the authorities starting to stir them up. Into that situation comes an event an unfortunate accident, perfect for their propaganda. No matter how dirty and underhanded it is, they'll shout their anti-empire views endlessly. And reading the complicated legal details of, of the discussion in the paper is too much trouble for most. Officially, of course, both countries declare it an accident and speak of it as an unfortunate misunderstanding. The official line from both sides is that the Commonwealth submarines, communications, and navigation equipment were malfunctioning from the start and had broken down, so the sub lost its way in Imperial waters, was unable to pick up the radio contact from the Imperial Mage unit on guard in the area, and began a training dive as part of its scheduled activities. Pardon me, scheduled exercises. 
Then, as a result of warning shots fired according to the laws of war, a high level of water pressure was applied to the hull of the submarine. About to be crushed, it performed an emergency blow. Then, both sides, implying that the other is to blame, deliver the ambiguous conclusion that as a result of life-saving operations performed by the Imperial mages, many injured crew members were treated at an Imperial hospital. But for those with serious injuries, the rescue was in vain, and they perished, sinking beneath the waves. It is also confirmed that the emergency mechanisms didn't function in time, and the submarine sank due to flooding. Additionally, both countries agree that the loss of life is regrettable, and that there will need to be discussions about how to prevent similar accidents moving forward. So according to that story, it was more of a shipwreck than a sinking by attack. What that means politically is that both sides admit to mistakes, but they agree to look together for a way to prevent future accidents. But if the Commonwealth wanted to, it could paint a very simple picture. Empire sinks Commonwealth vessel. She could see the headlines now. That would prime their public more than enough. It'd be like pouring gasoline on an already smoking fire. That is precisely why the Empire's Foreign Office is so anxious to avoid any further deterioration of the situation. No. To be more precise, everyone knows. Everyone knows that at this stage, the world is asking whether the other powers will allow the Empire to be the sole victor and invite the birth of a hegemonic state uh, or intervene to stop that from happening in the interest of balancing the great powers. So this is an excuse. Nothing more, nothing less. In reality, everyone has braced themselves long and hard for the future to come. If you have common sense powers of judgment, it's plain to see. The policymakers in both the Empire and the Commonwealth are aware that the clash between the two great powers is only a matter of time in coming. As such, the handling of Major von Degrichaf, one little magic officer, is not top priority. Basically, it's politics. But it is also true that as a result of all this, her presence is a bit complicated. So being sent to the Rhine is understandable. In one respect, this is where Major General von Zetour and von Rudersdorf were pushing to put her anyhow, so it can be done now without any awkwardness. The general staff is sending me and expecting results. The diplomats expect me not to cause any more issues. If possible, they'd like me to die out here. Then the legal specialists can escape this pain in the neck. Anyhow. Now that everyone and his brother wanted to send her and her troops west, the Devil of the Rhine sneered, and the situation on those lines became even more hellish. April 5th, Unified Year, 1925 AD, The Rhine Lines Life with shells from breakfast through brunch, Waking up to find your friend who was sleeping right next to you dead is a rarity that happens all the time in service on the forwardmost line. If you relax in the trenches, you get burned. That's why you have to smile, keep your mind sound, and watch out for your health. They say you can't fight a war with a smile, but wars without smiles are dangerous. If the troops lose the ability to smile, that's a bad sign. Times like those, you need to make sure they aren't drinking too much. If you don't want to get sniped at, you have to give up cigarettes. And that thought occurs to her, sorry, as that thought occurs to her, Tanya realizes with a start that she'd like to give herself a pat on the back for not wanting to drink even though they've confiscated so much alcohol. The only ones in the battalion who are getting enough drink and tobacco despite no rations are me and Lieutenant Serebriakov. Someone must care about us deeply. We even get playing cards and candy. Cocking her head, wondering whether girls are unexpectedly more suited to this type of warfare, Tanya is once again forcibly reminded how harsh life is in the trenches. 
even the soldiers most loyal to their nations, might turn traitorous if cards, one of their sole leisurely activities, were taken away. There are tens of thousands stationed on the front lines in this delicate mental state. Even on the most peaceful day in those trenches, the weather is rainy with a chance of shells. Apart from when we deal with snipers and harassing fire, we can just lie around in the damp and the mud, but we are probably only able to get away with that because mages are so scarce. <clears throat> mages have leeway to take a quick break in the rear and get cleaned up. We are worked that much harder when we get back, though, of course. On sunny days, vision is good, and we fight huge, fierce battles where blood demands blood. In this world, the number of shells flying around has reached the point where a single division consumes 1,000 tons in a day. How could they say artillery plows and the infantry advances? Sure, it's half true, but we can't advance. Anyhow, both materiel and men are being used as if they are worthless, and when Tanya steps back and thinks about it, it's unusual. The more she thinks about it, the more she wants to furrow her brows and frown in discontent. It's such a huge waste that she can't imagine a bigger one if she tried. Even I think human assets should be better taken care of. Once the troops receive their red slips and get called up, it costs money to train, outfit, and feed them. But here's this war where we are going through them like they're sold at bulk discount. Our meetings may not be with stockholders, but it's a wonder we don't get criticized. We're firing with such wild abandon, I want to grill them for about an hour to see how much kickback they're getting from Grouper for these shells. Who the fuck is Grouper? Anyway. Tanya doesn't doubt the importance of a curtain of fire. Of course, she understands all too well that without the views of her uh, she, sorry, she understands that all too well, without the views of her esteemed superiors. But she has told them they should at least attempt to cut costs where possible. The rear is such a mess that she has to sincerely wonder why there needs to be seven or eight different standards for railway guns alone. Never mind the 20 centimeter guns and whatnot. Why does there have to be so much variety among 80 centimeter railway guns used by thousands of men? No standardization at all. As someone with rotten experiences with an engineer, I suspect the Imperial engineers just made them because they wanted to. I wouldn't put it past them. Still, shouldn't they be at least a tiny bit interested in mass production? Anyhow, Faced with this scene, I can see why the military-industrial complex prefers war. So that is why Japan was booming during World War I. Ditto regarding quote-unquote special procurement during the Korean War. There is no way sales don't climb when you have consumers plowing through supplies at this tremendous rate. It is a perfect example of supply and demand in action. The market is so attractive, it almost makes me want to start up a private military company right now. Ah, the heartlessness. If they are going to waste us like this, they should at least raise our wages. They have the money to shoot these shells at the Republic like it's so much water, and those cost who knows how much a pop. They should give some thought to employee welfare. I'd like to receive more than just candy and snacks. Tanya is lost in these utterly normal thoughts for an employee to have when Lieutenant Srebriakov interrupts her with an administrative notice. Major, we've received word that the fresh mages have arrived at group command. They say they'd like to stop by to see about sorry, they say they'd like you to stop by to see about them. Fresh mages? Even if I wanted to replenish the battalion, we haven't lost anyone. Zero casualties. Tanya intends to do sorry Tanya intends to be performing the most cost-effective management on the insane Rhine front so she doesn't understand the relationship between her battalion and the new recruits are you sure they weren't stationed here by accident or did the message go to the wrong person 
though it's presumptuous, I did er uh, check myself, and there's no mistaking it, ma'am. I'm confused. I didn't even request any replacements. But Lieutenant Serebrikov says she didn't mishear, that she confirmed there was no misunderstanding. So Tanya has to think. Her adjutant understands that a battalion with no casualties requires no, re no, no replacements. Command understands this logic even better than Serebryakov, so it couldn't be them. On top of that, the battalion is already an augmented battalion. For a unit under a major's command, that's about as big as they get, and it's difficult to imagine being promoted and receiving new personnel so suddenly under these circumstances. The only logical inference to make is that we are in for some trouble. But why? I'm such... I am such good person... Okay, that's... This isn't spelt properly, and it's got a bunch of t fucking typos, but I'm going to read it as written and then try and infer what they're actually saying. I'm such good person, cost-conscious, and a stickler for compliance. They should There should be an A in there. I am such a good person, being what with being cost-conscious and a stickler for compliance to boot. If fate exists... I can guarantee she's a jerk. I thought fate would be referenced as male. Hmm. Again, things that should be written differently. If fate exists, I can guarantee he's a jerk. Well, he's probably in league with being X, so... <laughs> uh, this isn't for sure. It's only a rumor, but... I heard Command might want us to act as an instructor unit. What? And where did you hear that? Well, um, a classmate from the Cadet Corps is attached to command as an observer on the Rhine. She's in a different sector, but in a personal letter she said, quote, I heard you're going to be a teacher. Nice work. Hearing this plausible rumor through a random personal connection, Tanya finds herself asking for clarification. Lieutenant, your friend's ears are a little too sharp. Not that it's anything to be upset about. The duty to instruct recruits who aren't used to the battlefield yet, well, it's a bit late, but someone must have noticed the rate at which new troops fall. That's all well and good, but how did they conclude that we should be the instructors? But an instructor unit? <laughs> if that's true, no. The war going as it is, I doubt they'll have us fall back to the rear. So they're telling us to train rookies at the front? One of my men snorts. <laughs> As if he can't believe it. Exactly. Fresh recruits on a battlefield are dead weight that can't even be used to deflect incoming rounds. Honestly, they should be hauled off somewhere else before they get shot out of the sky. I don't want anyone in my way, and yet they assign me recruits to train? <laughs> Frankly, I want to scream at them to come over to the front and see for themselves whether that is even possible. But just as I'm thinking that... First Lieutenant Vice yells at himself. Unfreaking believable. I guess they think we can babysit while fighting a goddamn war. They all start shouting with no way to vent their indignation. Well, they're honest guys. And as one who's spent time shivering in a trench, I can sympathize. So we're supposed to keep the shells off them? Have you even heard something so stupid? Well, um... Everyone was a new recruit once. Still, Lieutenant Serebryakov cautiously stated comment. Sorry, Lieutenant Serebryakov's cautiously stated comment is correct. Watching after panicking newbies is a bona fide pain in the ass, but we were all new once. Going a step further, Tanya is already uh, Tanya has already fought on the Rhine while babysitting once before. Maybe it's because she has that experience that the brass is pushing it on her again. Yeah, it's true. I taught you on the Rhine, Lieutenant. Yes, Major. I've come this far thanks to you. Considering that, contrary to my expectations, I managed to find a useful subordinate. Maybe we just have to do our best and see if we can dig up someone good. This might be rude, but the Major's training seemed pretty harsh. I can't believe you... What's that, Lieutenant Vice? If you have something to say, go ahead and say it. Never mind. Excuse me, ma'am. 
From the look on my bickering subordinates' faces, it seems like they'll take care of the recruits. And it's an order, after all. Tanya unwittingly braces herself. Resigned to the situation, she has to force herself to accept the task. The reason she still can't think positive is that she knows reality. They are throwing new recruits into a world where you'll go crazy if you can't endure the misery of suppressive shellfire. She'll want to pull her hair out the day an untrained newbie makes a scene in the trenches or the lodgings at base. At least if it's at the base, she can shove them on the medical staff in the rear. But if they panic on the front lines, we won't have time for that shit. I won't know what to do. More importantly, panic is contagious. If one handsome newbie's face crumples into a teary mess, and then the brave ones who've been enduring everything start making a fuss, I won't be able to control it. If someone pukes everywhere, it'll start an unacceptable chain of nausea for everyone. In a worst-case scenario, I'll have no choice but to produce silence with a shovel. Okay, editor's note. Produce silence with a shuttle, a shovel, to shut someone up by hitting them. Doesn't really distinguish between knocking someone down, knocking them out, and killing them outright. Shovels are fantastic for rookie education. We can bury their waste products, shut them up, and, if necessary, bury them as well. They are useful no matter where you are, be it the trenches, at base, or in a graveyard. Well, that's fine and dandy, gentlemen. If that's our duty, we have no choice but to do it. That said, orders are orders, and it's not as if this one has been issued yet. It is important to confirm these things, you know. Anyhow, first, let's inquire with command. If it rings true, it'll be tough, but we'll just have to go through with it. We'll give it our all, you understand? If I ask for a confirmation on the rumor, I'll learn whether I want to do this or not. If it is true that we'll be rearing greenhorns, then we'll have to do it in the way that doesn't break our backs. Tanya braces herself. We can't be expected to hold their hands and coddle them every step of the way. Of course, I know that wasting precious human resources is a folly to be avoided, which is why I also think I'd like to do this one only as long as it doesn't put too much of a burden on me. This is Major von Degrichaf, about the new mages. So Tanya hazards a simple guess and receives confirmation right away. In a nutshell, the mission we've been given is to break the newbies in. From the phone conversation, Tanya makes a fairly certain guess that her unit will be training them. Then, the first thing to do is have them observe the firing line as soon as possible. I'll just be glad that the battalion shouldn't get thrown into anywhere actually dangerous. The front lines will teach them reality far better than a million words of explanation. Apparently, my troops agree. All right, I need a plan, to, a training schedule, is what I should have been thinking. Sorry, I need to, all right, I need to plan a training schedule, is what I should have been thinking. Yes, what I should have been thinking. Gentlemen, welcome to the Rhine Front. The fresh, the fresh recruits were sent over more efficiently than I expected. Tanya was thoroughly at a loss as she gave them a word of welcome. When command does something promptly, things are not normal. It's an anomaly, and you need to prepare yourself for the worst. In the army, not having to worry about command's mess of administrative procedures is the kind of aberration that should put you on your guard. <clears throat> Supplies get held up, reinforcements are delayed, but they'll send trouble over right away. <laughs> in other words, command being efficient is bad news, at least in this case. Which is why even Tanya wants to rip her hair out over the group of newbies they've been pushing onto her. Even though she knows it isn't becoming, she gets cranky and frowns. She braces herself, but why are these replacement personnel so utterly green? Lieutenant Weiss and the others all groan as they look over the careers of the recruits they've been assigned. <coughs> they aren't here for retraining or changing arms. 
They are literally a slab of fresh newbie meat right out of the fucking, right off the fu fucking civilian parade grounds. We are being given raw recruits whose only use is fodder for the meat grinder and being told, don't mince them. Evolve them into fighting chunks of steak. <laughs> I am your instructor, Ma Magic Major Von Degrichaf. If this was what was going to happen, I should have never gotten assigned to the instructor unit at Central. Tech research wasn't a proper workplace either, and the Elenium Type 95 is one more reason my head hurts. I guess I haven't been able to take proper advantage of my promotion opportunities. I just end up with more and more unfortunate connections. Tanya can't help but lament her circumstances. As you all know, the Rhine is hell. It is a graveyard, so to speak. She smiles weakly, thinking how it won't do for all the fresh meat to drop like flies, and describes the battlefield to them in frank terms as a warning. It would be better if they had received a little more training that's actually useful for their situation. Soldiers who don't understand are dead weight. Then again, on second thought, that's exactly why someone thought of making them a proper fighting force with this training mission. To break it down further, this is the wonderful Rhine Front, where the Republican Army will throw periodic welcome parties for any useless bodies who deserve to be disposed of, and you can get promoted two ranks in no time at all. Hmm. Still, the high rate of attrition on the Rhine lines can only be lamented. It is a fundamental problem. I am only a major, but all the superior officers here, when I arrived, were busy getting their posthumous double promotions, or they were lucky getting transferred or sent to the rear. Before I knew it, as a major, I was closer to the top of the command structure than the bottom. Oh, competition is so fierce in the Rhine lines, labor market, it'll make you pale, believe me. What would Darwin say if he saw this? Is this the ultimate progression of the theory of evolution? Or is it a desolate place where the theory of evolution breaks down? It is definitely a fascinating question. So anyone who wants to be a hero should go play with some snipers. <laughs> Any time you spend talking to idiots who don't listen is for nothing. And having them hang around using supplies is a waste. The best thing they can do is go make an enemy sniper use up a bullet. If I can get rid of idiots and tire our enemy snipers at the same time, it's not a bad deal, really. As for the rest of you, do your best not to get in the way. Well, if they follow instructions, they should at least be able to act as bullet repellent. Okay, gentlemen. We will probably only be together a short while, but let's all get going. Guess that's about it. Now then, time to work as much as I get paid to. Shovels are great. Shovels are the quintessence of civilization. With a shovel, you can dig a hole just deep enough to hide yourself. Or if you gather a bunch of people with them, you can dig a fine trench. If you change your viewpoint just a little, you can even dig a tunnel. So you can smash a sturdy enemy trench with mining tactics. Not that they get used all too often. A shovel is a good friend to any and every type of soldier. And a shovel is the best gear for a close quarters fight in a trench. Longer than a bayonet, simpler to handle than a knife, sturdier than any other tool. Not only that, but they are extremely cheap to make, so they are perfect for mass producing. Plus, I don't have to worry much about damaging my mind. This is it. The ideal piece of equipment. This is the point humanity was meant to reach. Civilization has developed the shovel as its, uh, as its pinnacle implement. Above all, it doesn't rely on magic, so it's optimal for stealth kills. With a shovel, it is possible to educate numbskulls who are dependent on magic scanning. Clang! We can say it's an indispensable item for nighttime raids. <laughs> Of course, it's an excellent general-purpose tool at any other time of day as well. The shovel is truly an implement born of civilization. 
Tanya murmurs, leading a unit to wish good evening to the enemy with their shovels. On this nighttime outing, they get all muddy as they crawl over the ground on their bellies. Her objective is clear. It's part of the new recruit education she has undertaken. <clears throat> Tanya has no problem forcing them to wriggle through this morass if she can beat it into them that the only ones who can dress nicely on the Rhine are dumbasses or corpses of heroes being sent to the rear. She doesn't want to, but when it's in order, she has no choice. And so, she is reluctantly crawling at the head of the group, biting her lip. If it were possible, she would want to go back this instant. But she is advancing across no man's land. Since the snipers have given up their day off and are going for the perfect attendance award, she and her troop, clad in the grey camouflage of the trench dress code, drag themselves inch by inch, painstakingly slow, towards the enemy camp. Sneaking forward, jumpy as a mouse with a heavy steel helmet on your head, is the height of humiliation. What torture that we can do nothing but sneak like this, covered in mud. This place is utter insanity. This is utterly uns ins un it should be unsanitary? It's insanitary. They spelled this wrong. This place is utterly unsanitary. The putrid reek of the unrecovered corpses of both sides has completely numbed my nose. Ach, how extraordinarily disgusting. Though conditions are severe enough that I lament as such, work is work. I curse the fruitlessness of this 3D, in brackets, dirty, dangerous, and demeaning, labor, for, labor from the bottom of my heart. Why are the higher-ups always asking for the impossible? To find out how all of this started, we have to go back several hours to the beginning. <clears throat> Whether you see it as a comedy of errors or a tragedy will depend on your point of view. The incident does, however, become the momentum for marked improvements in the Imperial Army's chain of command and communications channels. I'd like to hear your opinion on improving field battle capabilities. The operations staffer attached to command, who has come to visit Tanya that day, handed her a circulating notice. On it were the loss rates of new soldiers stationed on the Rhine lines as replacements, separated by arms of surface. What jumped out to her when she scanned the page was how high the numbers were. You could say the Empire's new soldiers were literally dropping like flies. <clears throat> As a frontline officer, she put the notice on her desk and sat down with a sigh. <sighs> These are what the rates will be if you have to deploy new recruits with not enough training or experience. If I may be so blunt, this is surely due to insufficient training and accelerated education. I should think that instead of learning how to march in formation, they need to be trained how to lie in a trench. Aside from that, perhaps they should also be baptized in the most difficult parts of trench warfare, under conditions that minimalize casualties. They certainly have a way to go in order to be useful, but we can't very well stand them up in front of the machine guns either. Seeing the important Colonel Psy bring his coffee to his lips and grimace, Tanya's face stiffened. On the, outward, on the forwardmost line, there is no way to provide adequate hospitality. She had given Lieutenant Serebriakov strict orders to make it the best cup of coffee she could under the circumstances, but there probably hadn't been enough fuel to boil the chalk out. The colonel had drunken some, so she did too, but it tasted awfully tainted. You don't like it, sir? That said, she showed him what it was like on the front lines by implying that that's just how it tastes they hear. I don't mean to nag you about conditions on the front, but this is horrible. It reminds me of the dining room at Central General Staff Office. <laughs> they must have better luck with water there, though. This is the front, this is the firing line. Tanya murmured, staring sadly into her butchered coffee, oozing a bit of helplessness. Even the taste of these luxury items wasn't the same on the front. <clears throat> they were in another world, 
removed from daily civilian life. It would be no easy task to throw in new recruits with only accelerated training and get them acclimated. You're saying we should give them a taste of this experience in the rear? If possible, they should be informed of the realities of the trenches so as to shatter their illusions about war. The numbskulls who want to be heroes end up killing not only themselves but their fellow soldiers. The newbies who try to pull off heroics in the trenches really are numbskulls. If one of them succumbs to the rush of adrenaline and does something reckless or makes a futile charge, at least the damage can be minimalized to affect just them. But oftentimes, they have the nerve to involve others in their debacle. On top of that, though you can't really blame them for a psychological phenomenon, I'm also really sick of them polluting the trenches with all varieties of incontinence and creating hotbeds for every type of infectious disease. That's why, with these young ones, I just... Ugh. Tanya groaned, burying her head in her hands. Hmm? What was that, sir? Oh, I just thought it was strange, given how young you are, Major. The one with infant military careers are useless. Of course, I'm sure it's a different story if they can manage to survive two months on the Rhine. Ah, uh, no, I forgot. I forget I said anything. Let's just get back to the topic at hand. I wasn't really sure why the colonel was mincing words. The whims of superior officers don't always make sense. And bringing up my age like that. Ugh. Tanya politely did as she was told and switched to their main topic without asking anything further. Tanya's age might be strange from an objective perspective, but subjectively, she could only think of years of service, similar to the way someone would say how long they'd been working at a company. Yes, sir. Uh, at present, we can't hope for large-scale mobile battles. All we can do... Uh, sorry, all we can have them do is hole up in the trenches and maybe shoot their guns. Anyhow... Tanya's idea about the loss rates, that they would improve a bit once the soldiers acclimated, was a violently realistic one, i.e., that's just how it goes in total war, where you're in a competition to literally grind up human resources at a slower rate than your enemy. Even if it made sense to be concerned about high losses, she thinks they are overly worried about the effect such losses might have on the lines. To Tanya, you can afford to overlook losses that aren't big enough to affect the ability of the organization to continue fighting. To put it another way, if they were dropping as fast as they were in All Quiet on the Western Front, things would be pretty much like the title of the movie, All Quiet. It's not just a movie, it's a book. I've read it. It's actually a really damn good book, and I highly recommend you read it. Even if divisions attack by night... Like in the Russo-Japanese War, it would be a cinch to repel them with machine guns and mage support. Well, we would have to be practical and expect casualties within some permissible range, since the newbies would still be learning the ropes. After all, <clears throat> I wasn't the one who'd be dying. Not that I wanted them to die if we could help it, at least not under my command. Indeed, it is difficult to imagine a large-scale mobile battle breaking out. You are probably correct that we should focus our instruction on other areas, but... Unfortunately, the colonel didn't say anything that negated what Tanya had said. Sorry, ultimately, the colonel didn't say anything that negated what Tanya had said. What came through in his anguished reply were the emotions he couldn't shake, the feeling of wrongness and hatred for this way of fighting that involved sending so many young to die. Neither can we ignore the damage being done in those smaller engagements. The problem is that even if the losses are small, they do stack up. Worst of all, morale will start to flag. But if an enemy engage but if an engagement with the enemy is small, it shouldn't be resulting in too many losses. Now wait a minute. Tanya seemed to be the only one present who thought those losses were within the permissible range. Compared to the rate of casualties in World War I, these little scuffles were adorable. 
but a normal person wouldn't usually use deaths in World War I as the yardstick, even if they were aware of it. And if they weren't, they would undoubtedly shiver at the inconceivable numbers. At most, a harassing raid would only kill the ones who would die anyhow, so that doesn't seem like such a big deal. A serious raid would be too high a risk, so the most the enemy can do is take a company of infantry for a sneak attack. The limit for mages would be a battalion-sized harassing attack. If that's all, the casualties the Imperial side could expect wouldn't be unsuitably high. <clears throat> Speaking in extremes, of course, with that thought, Tanya drained her awful coffee and reached for a mint candy as a palate cleaner, palate cleanser. The large gap in experience between veterans and newbies can only be explained by how much actual combat they've been through. My unit rate of loss was far and away the lowest, but the replacements from other units were starting to get injured, albeit gradually. The soldiers who got their first taste of combat in the easy Dakian War were lucky. If your first time is this rough, it must take a long time to get used to it. Major von Degrichaf, don't you think, with your instruction and direction, the loss rate could be lowered? If you order me to do it, I'll do my utmost. But ultimately, our only option for these first-time combatants is to teach them step by step. On a battlefield with snipers, pointing at a moron who got shot is far more persuasive than telling them, don't stick your head out. While trenches diminish the effectiveness of field guns, concentrated fire from large-caliber heavy artillery reduces even reinforced concrete to rubble. So don't all hide in the same place. They'll understand well enough if you make them recover the bodies of the poor radio operators who suffocated when they were buried alive in a pillbox. Take writing the alphabet, for example. If you don't go A, B, C, step by step, and actually teach them how to write it, then there's no fucking point. When that occurs to her, Tanya realized her battalion still hadn't experienced some things on the Rhine either. The obstacle of trenches certainly changed the way night battles were fought. They changed the way guard duty was performed as well, and the replacement troops were definitely not used to it. Newbies and veterans alike had to deal with warnings being given at the drop of a hat, and maybe this was compounded by the mages not having much opportunity to be in the trenches themselves during the day. That said, it seemed to be as you say. From what I've seen, I agree that we should be able to improve a bit more, said Tanya upon reflection. In other words, she needed to educate the fresh recruits under the assumption they were unfamiliar with the trenches themselves. The change in environment and premises required, train required retraining. <clears throat> yes, that's right. Their combat in, in environments where they can't rely on magic is particularly unbearable to watch. And Tanya nodded in response to the colonel's observation. The mages were trained under the assumption they'd be deployed both protect as they'd be deploying both protective films and defensive shells. So they really didn't so they so they really did suck at stealth combat. The shameful sight of newbies unconsciously protecting themselves and then getting targeted by the enemy annoyed the hell out of her. It's true that even though they are under strict orders not to use magic in the trenches, there are too many examples of people leaking signals without realizing and getting picked up by the enemy. <clears throat> Having said that, it really started to hit home. Oh right, there was also an incident where a whole unit got blown away because some dumbass gave away their position while they were getting ready. There had been an inquiry, of course, but did anyone attempt to reevaluate replacement training as a result? Ugh, it really is an issue when one person's mistake multiplies the damage and harms the many. Having jumped to that conclusion through logic incomprehensible to others, she was touched thinking it was good that the higher-ups cared about improving the situation. You're worried about even the small-scale battles with recruits this undertrained? Damn right. Heinrich's law. There is always the risk that letting small errors go will lead to getting majorly burned. <clears throat> 
Anne Murphy's law teaches us about the dangers of ignoring the possibility of failure. Humans are numbskulls. If there is a way to fail, someone will figure out how to do it at some point. Okay, um, there's no editor's note, but just so you guys know, Murphy's Law, Murphy was, I believe, a test pilot for the U.S. military and has been quoted as saying, basically, if there's anything that can go wrong, it will go wrong eventually. So if I fly this plane 100 times and it works fine, 101st time it's going to explode and kill me. <laughs> So yeah, very appropriate. As for Heinrich's Law, again, don't know what that's a reference to. The only Heinrich I can think of is Heinrich Himmler, and I don't think this is a quote or reference to him in any way, shape, or form. Could be wrong. Continuing. In that case, time, sorry, and Murphy's Law teaches us about the dangers of ignoring the possibility of failure. Humans are numbskulls. If there is a way to fail, someone will figure out how to do it at some point. In that case, Tanya, shocked at her own pride, felt her heart stop. The higher-ups must be apprehensive about the shaky new recruits, not for some baseless reason, but because they've discovered some risk that officers across the front have been carelessly overlooking. How perceptive. I need to hand it to him from an HR perspective. There is, I need to hand it to him from an HR perspective. They've certainly planned this well. There's no guarantee that these recruits won't worsen if things develop into a massive battle. So if there are even small ways to improve, we have to try it. That's exactly the issue. Large-scale engagements notwithstanding these smaller skirmishes. Even if the current assumption is that a large-scale battle won't break out, the operations staffer emphasized that even the present human losses couldn't be ignored and felt, as any decent person would, that this level of harm, this mass production of corpses, was immoral and wrong somehow, inherently. Meanwhile, Tanya nodded, quite right, at everything the colonel said, but nevertheless took no particular issue with the losses as such. Rather, she thought the biggest problem was that many of their units were inferior due to being formed mainly with replacements. <clears throat> Certainly, even if the chance of a large-scale fight was neg negligible, they were currently leaving open the possibility of failure and, pli and piling up small errors. Actually, after having this pointed out to her, her most serious concern was the very real, albeit sporadic, instances where one person's error had caused catastrophic damage. Far too many, in her opinion. She worried that newbies who couldn't function without relying on magic could be a major component of failure on a high-risk mission. You were on an operation in Norden where you couldn't rely on magic, yes? I imagine you have a handle on the gist of it. As you say, sir. I'm ashamed to say I hadn't been thinking about it, but I'll keep it in mind when I'm teaching. <clears throat> the idea of requesting error prevention measures indicates, in a way, healthy operation of the organization. In civilian life, trouble can usually be dealt with by firing the person who made the mistake. In the army, however, one person's mistake means every, it can mean that everyone dies. One for all, all for one. It is a truly wise saying. Yes, it's a reference to the Three Musketeers, which I believe is like an English play. Anyway, continuing. <clears throat> if one person fails, everyone dies. And if everyone else messes up, one person's fierce fighting won't be enough to win in the end. About that, um, I appreciate that instruction is happening, but it is far from enough. The issue really is a lack of actual combat experience. The colonel was enthusiastic, thinking he'd gotten her to understand his opinion. Thus, he and Tanya entered a strange misunderstanding without realizing the, incong the incongruity of their views because they saw only their agreement that something needed to be done. Yes? Uh, what, what is it, sir? <clears throat> Can you give them some experience? What they needed more than protected experience in a large operation was through repetition and review in small-scale battles. 
That is what Tanya believed, so although she didn't want to, she resolved to go on a non-magic raid. Yes, combat experience should be gained alongside a well-trained unit with extraordinarily low loss rates. Experience trumps schooling. Sir, experience, yes. There was no point in training corpses. There was no telling on the ground when the chance would arise to do a large-scale mobile battle or breakthrough or difficult operation like an infiltration attack. As long as that was the case, troops should be kept trained up so they could respond to orders at any time. Tanya kicked herself for her careless neglect. I didn't want losses in my unit, and I figured if I put the newbies out to pasture, the battlefield would turn them into master soldiers. But that was the wrong way to go about it. Yeah, if there's a chance to train them in the trenches for a while, I'd like to have them fight with, our, with your troops. It was true that having her battalion go to the trenches with the new recruits as an instructor unit would reinforce the front. The Empire sure gets all they can out of their people. The shocking truth had just started dawning on Tanya that in the abnormality of war, she had lapsed into irrationality and laziness. This is why war is bad, she thought. War numbs humanity and reason and drives you crazy with rotten fantasies. When the thought crossed her mind, she had been on the verge of resisting, saying, you're telling me to leave the rear and throw myself into the fucking trenches? And only, not only that, but take a bunch of dead weight with me and train them. <laughs> she was ter and train them? She was terrified to see how tainted her own thoughts were. Even though I know that being hasty and short-sighted is most likely a cause of is most likely to cause a failure. Once I experienced it, I got a good taste of how easy it is to fall into that trap. Understood. I'll do my best to instruct the unit. Great. I'll prepare the written orders immediately. Sorry for the pressure, but we're counting on you. Yes, sir. Leave it to me. I'll have results to show in no time. And so, neither of them realized there was a definite contradiction in their views, and Tanya moved ahead with carrying out her orders. Taking her time to enjoy her dinner, she has the company commanders under her, under her prepare for a night battle, and confer with the leader of the recruits. <clears throat> she also points out to her Batman, I think they mean Bateman, Batman, why the fuck does it say Batman? She also points out to her Batman, what the fuck, that the potatoes are inexcusably old. It's supposed to be Bateman, there's a typo here. When he replies that the supply unit is bringing canned goods as a top priority, she is forced to reluctantly back down because she senses her superiors are focused on logistics, network, maintenance, and efficiency. The light railway is handling about as much traffic as it can take, so they're probably prioritizing canned goods since those keep for a long time and can be transported according to a preset plan. In other words, I shouldn't expect raw vegetables or fresh meat, or fish for that matter, anytime soon. The calories, at least, should be up to regulations. Still, when she hits upon that prospect, she has to accept the reality that her already simple table will become even drearier. Well, I guess the only ones who get to expect decent meals at war are the Navy. <laughs> Lucky bastards. Or maybe just the submarine squads, for that matter. I've heard they get treated fairly well. Of course, everything else about their situation is the absolute worst. Basically, they're beginning to prioritize ease of transport, and that makes sense to her. She certainly can't argue against it, so with nothing else to do, she lays down her sword on the food issue and continues her meeting. <clears throat> that is how essentially close cooperation and maintaining leadership will be in the upcoming operation. After all, discipline in a normal mage battalion night battle would be managed via magic, but if they were to cast interference formulas in the middle of no man's land, they'd be detected and shot at. No individual radios will be distributed either. Fighting, at night, fighting a night battle under these conditions with fresh recruits is incredibly reckless. 
Operation Eagle Claw, heading for Iran, probably had a higher chance of succeeding. Okay, now they're making a reference, I believe, to the Iran-Iraq War. Okay, so Operation Eagle Claw, heading for Iran, probably had a higher chance of succeeding. So should we split into autonomous platoons for the raid? Just one Imperial Mage platoon is said to have firepower equal to a company of regular infantry. Well, practically speaking, an infantry company and a mage platoon really can probably deliver the same amount of damage. Plus, it's a night battle. If we hit them with that much firepower under the veil of darkness, we can probably expect widespread confusion on their end. But then, to continue fighting, we'll have to rely on magic. That means the second we cast interference formulas, it is, prob it is probable that the enemy retreats and the whole area gets bombarded indiscriminately. <clears throat> well, that, or we could just take checking, or we could just take checking machine gun fire. What the hell does that mean? Do they mean bring machine guns or take out their machine guns? Not well written here. So should we infiltrate as companies? It's realistic, but on a whole new on a whole new scale of difficulty. It is not a bad idea to have each group perform a feint and then attack from four totally different locations. But sending in all four companies would mean that even as an augmented battalion, we wouldn't have any muscle in reserve. I want to say I want to stay in the rear under the pretext of commanding the reserves, so I can't accept that plan. Hmm. Looking out for her own self-interest. Sensible. <clears throat> I will take the most highly trained first company. Having all the other companies perform the raid would be best for me, but my subordinates are advocating up for a plan where first company is the main attacking force. They want to go without reserves and have the others faint. The objective of our night battle is the abduction of enemy soldiers for interrogation, which is relatively less difficult. Basically, we'll invite enemy sentries from a warning trench to be friends for intelligence to chat with. Ooh, joy. In other words, you all want to avoid engaging as much as possible. Yes, Commander. Honestly, it'll be impossible to fight with those recruits along. I suppose it is important to avoid combat. My orders are simple. Give them night battle experience. Period. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. Oh my god, that's a Sun Tzu quote. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. Or endeavor to understand one another in an advanced, civilized manner. I believe the full quote was, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles, but if you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Yes, why am I quoting Sun Tzu right now? Jesus. Anyway, to do that end, a bit of nocturne... Oh, fuck, hang on. Or endeavor to understand one another in an advanced, civilized manner. To that end... A bit of nocturnal hiking to invite enemy soldiers over isn't so bad. No, it's not bad. Well, it's not good either. <laughs> I guess things can't be declared simply good or bad. More a mixed shade of grey. I am concerned about speed. More than anything, this will demand a swift withdrawal. Without thinking, I've already voiced a worry. Well, as the one in charge, I have to consider and prepare for all eventualities. <clears throat> I can't get away with saying, oops, I didn't think about that. If I say it's possible and fail, I'll be laughed at. If I say it's impossible and still fail, I'll be reprimanded as inept. I am compelled to raise concerns. We need to think seriously about this. Any resisting enemy soldiers won't be killed, but knocked out. Well, that's easy for a mage to do. We get a lot of practical experience on how to leave people neither dead nor alive in the military academy and basic training. The venerable uh, Dai Gongen and Zhu Shou come in surprisingly and handy. I have no idea what those things are. What the fuck? Probably some kind of 
weapons to knock people out, and they sound Chinese. I, I don't know why they're in this story. We are up against soldiers instead of farmers. But in terms of governing theory, the result is the same. Well, no. I am actually much more comfortable doing it to civilians. Oh, so she's much more comfortable oppressing the civilians than and like kidnapping them than kidnapping armed soldiers. Reasonable. We should also tap them lightly with the flat side of a shovel. If you swing a shovel sideways, it slices, but if you hit with the flat, that's one down. They really are convenient. So much so that I'd almost like to have all the recruits participate armed only with shovels. But what do we do once we capture our guests? If the warning trench sends out an alert, our only option will be to fight or run. As long as our objective is to take prisoners, fighting is pointless. When all you've got is the muscle of a group on Force Recon, dealing with the counterattacking unit in a trench fight is a completely futile battle of attrition. And if we were to miss our chance to pull out, we would literally die in vain. That is why, after we achieve our appointed objective, there is no reason to stick around. When your work is done, there is nothing better than going straight home. Which is why we can prioritize speed without fretting over the mana signals we'll, be, we'll have been concealing up until then, and go literally flying out of there with flight formulas. There is no better way to let your mana signal loose and hightail it away from the battle lines than a flight formula. Hooray for fight flight formulas. Well, we have to run for our lives for a couple minutes, but if we can't get away, we'll be blown up in a hail of SOS fire. I don't know what SOS is standing for in this context. Normally it's SOS save our souls distress signal type thing, but... I'm guessing it's something to do with uh, surface to surface or surface to air. Anyway, well, another way to look at this is that as long as whatever gets us makes a clean hit, we won't have to suffer. <laughs> that said, everyone wants to enjoy life. Even suicidal people aren't born in such a passionate state of despair over their existence that they want to kill themselves. If they are able to believe in the future, humans all have the wonderful potential to build a bright, peaceful tomorrow. Humans are irreplaceable. We are all unique. At least, I don't know about other people, but I have no substitute. That is why I want to survive, no matter what it takes. No, I will survive. To that end, I'll even praise the devil as God for those couple minutes to go full throttle. I'm saying that we'll keep an eye out for each other as we withdraw, but I'm definitely not stopping for anyone. Falling behind means being taken prisoner if you're lucky, or death in battle if you're not. Well, seems like you're appropriately nervous, gentlemen. Apparently, all my subordinates have a screw loose. I have screws loose. I mentioned a concern, so why are they talking about appropriately nervous? Was it a mistake to gather a bunch of war addicts when I formed my unit? <laughs> I wanted to take a little space. I hunt for someone with some other, some normal, rational opinion. When I scan my troops, I see Lieutenant Serebriakov raising her hand. Um, Major, the last few minutes are the dangerous part. Although we do have to give the new recruits support on our way over as well. This is a much more sensible viewpoint. We'll be fine on the approach unless someone makes a sound or some numbskull gives off a mana signal. Lieutenant, you and I have seen enough newbies screwing up in the Rhine to make you sick. You can handle them, right? If need be, but Major, I'm going to do my best to cover for them so that won't be necessary. Hmm. Well... Let's go over the opinion the opinions we have been presented with. Let's round up the most sensible conclusions we have. Article 1. Do all we can to avoid combat. Peace is best, of course. No reason to oppose that, uh, to oppose that. Article 2. Send the strongest unit. This is irritating, but in terms of military sense, I can't argue with it. Accepted for its prudence. Article 3. 
If we don't get discovered, the approach is possible. Withdrawing will be dangerous. These are the points we have collected. It is probable it is probably the safest plan as well. That is, if we arrange for a steady advance and a swift withdrawal, I guess we have off we shouldn't have any problems. And if the troops make a mess of it, they'll have officers and NCOs, that's non-commissioned officers, with plenty of Rhine experience to back them up. Lieutenant Srebriakov and the others who have come up through the ranks will probably do a proper job of that. Good. I'll notify them of the plan. Now, which of the fresh mages will I take on our first picnic? Hmm. Dinner, with, dinner was potatoes that night, and a little bit of fresh meat. Everything else was canned. Mages are usually treated rather well, and I'm even an officer at that, but this is what we can get. This is still the rear base, so I'm told it's on the good side. I wonder what the situation is on the front line. I hear the great army is putting pressure on the enemy lines, but logistics is probably still struggling. With those things on his mind, Magic 2nd Lieutenant Warren Grants, who had finally just been commissioned, ate his food quickly, like soldiers do. The meal was better than the rations at the field exercise grounds. At least, it satisfied his appetite, and his tongue didn't reject it. But even if the food was better, he had actually been feeling depressed for a few days. After all, he was being sent to the district with the fiercest fighting. No, when he left the academy, he even trembled with excitement at being sent to the Rhine sometimes. He even thought he'd rack up brilliant exploits and become a hero. Oh boy. <laughs> but that enthusiasm withered the closer the military train got to the Rhine district on the way to the front. What he saw were shell craters and burned, blistering things. Everything in his field of vision was a slate gray. All of it. Scorched fields. By the time the pungent odor began invading his nose, his spirit was deflated, and the thunder of a large gun, maybe an imperial railway gun, intensified his worries. Before he knew it, he and the others were restlessly glancing around, noticing that many of their fellows wore the same anxious faces. During that journey, one of the few ways to pass the time was sharing rumors. As he'd heard, the old stagers either slept, played cards, or split. Ah, fuck. As he'd heard, the old stagers either slept, played cards, or spread rumors. Grants dozed now and again, otherwise chatting as the train rocked along. He had heard some rumors he knew of too. For example. One legend at the academy said a second-class student had what once murmured that Cadet Degrichov was more terrifying than the battlefield itself. She certainly is scary. Such were the thoughts running through his mind as he presented himself at Rhine Command. When he arrived, he heard he would be attached to an instructor unit, which was a relief. According to command, he'd been re he would be retrained as a replacement before getting his assignment. So the first thing to do was get used to the front lines. Maybe I can do this. It was several days ago that he had thought that. Gentlemen, welcome to the Rhine front. If the devil exists, it has to be our instructor. The commander of the 203rd Aerial Mage Assault Battalion, the legendary... Major von Degrichaff. The way she smiled, the way she looked at us like we were maggots, the way she seemed thirsty for blood. I'd believe she had tried to kill a rebellious underclassman or crack his skull open. If I screw up on the battlefield, she'll definitely kill me. That's how threatened I felt by the instructor who just had to also be my advisor. Sorry. That is how threatened I felt by the instructor who just had to also be my advisor. Lord knows I want to cry. Ugh. Out of all of the, repl the replacements, I was the one who would have been through the academy. Sorry, out of all the replacements, I was the only one who had been through the academy. Jesus Christ. 
In other words, everyone either didn't know the rumor that she was a demon in the guise of a little girl, or laughed it off. The ones who figured they could handle war if that little kid could were on the safer side. Just the thought of what the ones who underestimated her might do made my stomach hurt. Sorry, stomach lurch. I'd never hated the word collective responsibility so much. Tonight, I'm off duty. I should go to bed early. It happened just as I thought that. We were summoned. The 203rd Aerial Mage Battalion was ordered to appear in the briefing room, grouped by platoon within three minutes. Hurry up, run! I urged my platoon, who had been finishing dinner, raced over to the briefing room and just barely made it at two minutes and 51 seconds. No other platoons had arrived yet. Well, no. In ran 7th platoon. They'd been completing, they had been competing with those of us in 4th platoon. That second, the three minutes were up. And the next second, the superior officer broke into, officers broke into broad grins and went to get the tardy platoons. Did the others even feel bad for being late? <laughs> Christ. In any case, we all assembled quickly, and our smiling battalion commander announced a night picnic plan. Not that it involved anything like a picnic. Unfortunately, gentlemen, I think that aside from 4th and 7th platoons, you deserve penalties. This was the major who had once said during a speech at the academy that deadweight should be killed. I pitied the groups who hadn't been able to make it in three minutes because I figured they would be thrown into hell, but that wasn't right. In order to teach you the importance of haste, I am sending you to the trenches. Since you don't seem to understand when I tell you, you'll experience firsthand what happens to slowpokes. They would actually be buried in the depths of hell. The shocked mages were immediately assigned to the warning trench. The warning trench on the front lines of the district was the worst fought with the worst fighting. They would be what all are commonly called canaries, the first to get attacked on the forwardmost line. The mortality rate was naturally the highest. It was a position where you couldn't rest for even a moment. By the way, they are called canaries after the caged birds that are taken into mines. The comparison is made because of the criticism that the raison d'etre of anyone in this post is to stop responding. But I shouldn't have been relieved. Now then, you fine, punctual fellows, I have a reward for you. <clears throat> she looked at us one by one as if she was going to tell us something wonderful. My platoon mates next to me seemed to be expecting a reward, but I wasn't. I had a really bad feeling. You get a little, uh, you get a little amity building recreation. We'll go on a picnic, make a toast, and invite some new friends to come back with us. I guess you could call it a party. As soon as she said that, someone handed up us a pamphlet that said field trip guide. Picnic procedure? First, equip hand grenades and your shovel. Then, ready your rifle and computation orb. Dress in night camouflage for CQB. By the way, if you use your computation orb or rifle without permission, you'll be shot or beaten to death for treason. Republican soldiers are people too. That means you can make friends with them? Question mark? Then why did we have to knock them out with shovels? In ancient times, people made friends by talking with their fists, no? <clears throat> Civilized people of the present use the implement born of civilization, the shovel. What the hell? This is crazy. No one said it aloud, but it was the look on everyone's faces. This was a nighttime mission to abduct enemy soldiers, a so-called intelligence gathering mission, but extremely dangerous nonetheless. If we were going to drag enemies back with us, it went without saying that we would have to approach the enemy trenches. Basically, we had to sneak up to the enemy position, where machine guns, all types of heavy artillery, inf infantry guns, snipers, and a shit ton of soldiers were waiting, and abduct enemies out of the warning trench, which was the place that was on highest alert. 
fuck, we're all gonna die. It was from there that things were, would get really intense. After using your shungle, shovels to mingle with lots of friends, let's invite them, some of them to our house. But I think all our friends will try to keep us from leaving in various ways. The field trip lasts until you shake them off and make it home? Incidentally, I'm not too worried about you punctual fellows, but one thing. She beamed. Oh, please, dear God, save us. If you're too slow, we are leaving you behind. Yes, that's right. Anyone who wants a quick double promotion can stay out there. We wouldn't want to hinder your success in life. She snickered. She said the same sort of thing when I first met her. I didn't realize it was word for word the truth. Magic Second Lieutenant Warren Grants realized he was shaking. My survival instinct was screaming. I wanted to avoid the war, the combat, the killing. I was hesitating. But one glance from Major von Degrichaf was enough to subjugate that instinct. She was far more terrifying than war. We sallied forth like lambs being herded by a sheepdog. No one raised so much as a groan. We advanced under the cover of night, crawling in silence. The commander was the first to strike. We heard the thudding of her shovel, followed by the grunts of several people. We whacked the enemy soldiers caught with their guards down, too, as if our lives depended on it. How much time passed after that? It felt like the experience lasted a lifetime, but in reality, t'was only a few dozen seconds. <clears throat> it was a short moment. During that tiny amount of time, all of the enemy soldiers in the specific, a specified area of the warning trench were either incapacitated or deep in a sleep they would never wake from. I could still feel the shock of the shovel impact in my hand. It was different from the recoil of shooting like we were taught at the academy. That particular feeling, the, the sensation of crushing something, of, was still impressed upon my body. If I had been left like that, I wonder what, have ha what would have happened to me. It's time. Company. Carry the prisoners. Newbies, your support. In 30 seconds, the magic ban is lifted. We are flying out of here. Sink your watches. Three, two, one, start. But the orders delivered in a calm, unruffled whisper brought me back to reality. Combined with my training, they slowly got my body moving. That is what I had been drilled for. My training saved me. As instructed, 30 seconds later, I started up my computation orb at full throttle and took off without hesitation. We really hightailed it back to our own defensive lines. It only took a few minutes. All we had to do was fly, pure and simple. But it was horrible. My heart raced with every artillery shot. It hurt to breathe. I was so terrified, I hardly felt like myself anymore. <clears throat> when we climbed up high to avoid being shot accidentally and set a safe course for the rear base, all the stress left my body at once and wariness washed over me. How could the major just calmly sing like uh, how could the major just calmly sing a hymn under such circumstances as these? Today, after completing her morning exercises and eating breakfast, Major von Degrichaf reaches for her pen as if she's made up her mind. In the rear base, the mail can get through. Naturally, it is possible to send a letter if necessary. It's military mail, so sometimes there are delays, but in general, things can be sent and received like any normal letter. Of course, someone like her with no relatives doesn't have any personal letters to write. She only ever writes on official business or unofficial business. What she is writing this time is official. That said, in a rare case, she takes out her stationery hesitantly, and her pen moves over the paper awkwardly. <clears throat> she has already written a pile of these documents. She just accepts that they are work and gets them done. But today, the tip of her pen feels heavy. Well, it would be stranger if a person could write it without trouble. To the dear family of Warrant Officer Anluk E. 
Cartesianen? Cartesianen. Cartesianen, okay. And look, E. Cartesianen. I am magic major Tanya von Degrichaf, his superior officer. I regret to inform you that your one and only young, young Anluk I. Kachtianen is being discharged with a disability. He became abruptly ill during an operation, and the surgeon has judged that it would be difficult for him to endure lengthy military service. His recovery will most likely require a long recuperation period at home or in a military hospital. The personnel division has agreed to go ahead with this treatment plan. Please speak with him and ensure that he has a restful convalescence, and please forgive us for returning your child in such a condition. He is an outstanding mage, our irreplaceable brother-in-arms, brave and trusted by all. We are deeply saddened to no longer have Anluk i Kachianen in our ranks. Small consolation though it may be, I recommended him for the Field Service Badge First Class and the Disability Medal, both of which were approved. I hope he makes a full recovery. Sincerely, Triple X in brackets, Unit Commander, Imperial Army, Magic Major Tanya von Degrichaf. To think, the day would come when I'd lose a man to some bad potatoes. Apparently, the legendary remark from an American Thunderbolt pilot that even a veteran can't beat food poisoning wasn't a joke. So those potatoes really were rotten after all. Tanya puts away her pen, irritated by the worsening logistics situation. Sending a letter to the family when something happens to a subordinate is the superior officer's responsibility. And I'm not against writing, but for Christ's sake, food poisoning from potatoes? Of all the ways to go. Tanya had finished the letter, but she has complicated feelings about the incident and can't get over it. He had eaten, participated in a night raid, and shocked me upon our return by throwing up and complaining of an awful stomach ache. I was dumbfounded. A veteran writhing about like that. I was sure he had to have been hit by an NBC weapon. Uh, NBC would be like nuclear, biological, or chemical. Those work even on mages. I hurriedly cast a medical formula, but it only eased the pain. Protective film provides comprehensive NBC coverage, and I remember we were on the verge of panicking that some new weapon not on that list had been developed. When the surgeon rushed over and examined him, we were finally able to sigh in relief. <sighs> in other words, it was just sudden, acute food poisoning. And it only hit unlucky Anluk E. Katyanin. He was a good mage, damn it. I never thought I would send someone away from the front like this. But it's really great that personnel treated his condition as a disability. This way, he gets his pension and his honor as a soldier remains intact. And I, as an officer, won't have the blemish on my record of a dishonorable subordinate. I mean, really. You can only really laugh at an officer who loses a man to bad potatoes. Who would have thought I had a guy in my unit who would be taken out, on, out of the fight by his own stomach? Nah, it's not even funny. The Republican bombardments come as always, shaking our position like clockwork. But I must feel oddly reflective on this auspicious day, because I sent a man to the rear for a difficult-to-verbalize reason. That said, what we learned from this lesson was promptly applied. As such, this morning's breakfast was bacon, hard biscuits, and ersatz coffee. The vegetable soup featuring the guilty potatoes was hastily disposed of. Personally, I worry about my diet being unbalanced without vegetables, but there's nothing to be had for it. I had someone get go get to go to get supplies from thing <sighs> I had someone go to get supplies first thing this morning, so I figured maybe we'll get the chance to eat canned vegetables with lunch. And well, even if we are on a battlefield, we can't escape falling into routines. I'm a bit sick of it. It'd be great if we could get a, meet, uh, get a meal that's not part of the rotation. 
Aside from these things, our daily battles in the trenches take place in the world of all quiet on the Western Front. Yeah, okay, they're literally ripping from the book now. That's great. We basically repeat the same pattern day after day. The only novelty to keep my attention is whether the recruits training on the front lines are doing well or not. Well, I only put them in yesterday. Tanya expects that after a week's baptism of, by fire in the trenches, she'll find out whether they are usable or not. <clears throat> if not, all she has to do is send them back and apply for their retraining. So although she regrets war's brand of tunnel vision, she devotes herself to instructing her troops. First, just as her boss said, she gave them the most difficult test first. Despite the risks, she reluctantly took them on a night raid, but to her surprise and delight, they only lost two men. Though she told everyone they were leaving within 30 seconds, that pair couldn't help, uh, sorry, couldn't keep up and were blown away in an artillery barrage. A fact confirmed by one of her subordinates after the fact. That was all. Apart from that, the newbies all followed instructions to the letter and no one went insane. As Tanya mulls over the recruits' misfortune to be blown up together in their two-man cell, she finds herself in a somewhat philosophical mood and begins to wonder about the, whole, about the role of luck in food poisoning. In any case, she's doing what she needs to do. But actually, even though she's doing what she must, she sometimes gets doubtful looks. For instance, she reports in, I'm instructing them according to your orders. And the response she received was, Roger, good luck. But then, when they went on the night raid and lost only two men, the higher-ups told her to be more careful next time. She began wondering if maybe they wanted her to do it with zero losses. <laughs> but this is a battlefield, she argued. And we went on a high-risk operation. Losing two newbies under those circumstances is not bad, all things considered. But when it comes to luck, it seems Tanya has to admit that she needs to take certain things into account. Still, she finds it lamentable that just because they don't want any losses at all, and her unit got unlucky, the blame is laid squarely on her as the commander who was present. I know history repeats itself in little ways, from private companies to the Yankee military. For example, when that guy, MacArthur, ordered his subordinate Eisenhower to plan a parade and then insisted he had no memory of it, there are a number of rotten incidents like that throughout time. St still, Tanya is feeling really sad. Ugh, I might start to cry. I mean, I'm a little girl, you know. When her thoughts stray, she suddenly realizes she feels off. Her mind floods with the horror of psychological contamination. She runs off in search of some kind of help, as if her life depends on it. A doctor. I need a doctor. April 28th, Unified Year 1925. Imperial Army General Staff Office joint meeting of the service corps and operations. Well, it is the appointed hour, gentlemen. So I would like to begin the joint meeting between the service corps and operations surrounding the pros and cons of the Rhine offensive plan. The officers presiding over the meeting spoke, but no one followed him, and silence reigned. In contrast with the splendid interior of the building, the expressions of the high-ranking men in the meeting room were dour. Some of the officers were practically tearing their hair out with incessant worries, unsure of what to do, and among them was Major General von Zetour. The situation changed from moment to moment, and just getting a handle on what was going on was incredibly difficult. Moreover, the Empire was leaning from the rising pile of corpses courtesy of the Republicans. Sorry, it was learning from the rising pile of corpses courtesy of the Republicans how fundamentally impossible a frontal breakthrough was in trench warfare. That is to say, the price of a frontal assault on the trenches was far too high. 
On the other hand, a large-scale firepower offensive would put too much strain on the supply lines. <coughs> they had just approved they had just improved the supply line light rail to the front. But even so, they were already there were already requests from every post for reinforcements coming in day after day. The burden on supply had blown through pre-war estimates long ago. The Entente Alliance was essentially collapsing, and it was necessary to allot some military strength to the area for a short time to ensure its collapse, which also weighed heavily on logistics. Even the local army group alone was enough to secure overwhelming superiority for the Imperial Army in the north, but the harsh winter weather had held them back. They weren't in a situation where they could spare troops to reinforce the main fighting lines on the Rhine. These lines would probably be frozen stiff until next spring. In other words, it would be a while before they could expect any easing up on the supply line burden from the north. Meanwhile, the navy was in the process of gaining superiority in the channel against the Republic. But the navy and army disagreed on whether that, that was a good thing or not. The air and magic forces were prepared to support either side if asked, but the army's and navy's worries were just so different in nature. <clears throat> the navy apparently couldn't wait to break through the channel. After all, their ambition was to wipe out the Republican fleet in a battle of warships. They even proposed doing an amphibious operation afterward, like with the Entente Alliance, to completely annihilate the country. As far as Zatour could see, taking command of the sea for a landing operation seemed likely to keep casualties down far more effectively than advancing by breaking through the trenches. The issue was the safety of the route if they went by sea. If they broke into the channel between the Republic and the Commonwealth, they had to be worried about how the superficially neutral Commonwealth would react. Would it just stand quietly by? He had already been over these questions with Major General von Rudersdorf. They were both forced to conclude that if they entered the channel, the Commonwealth would probably interfere in order to maintain the balance of power. Should that come to pass, the fears that made the rounds of the office in predictions of the shape and direction of the current war and theory of total war, both written by Tanya von Degrichaf, I might add, would come true. Yes, world war. The war's expansion would be like a never-ending chain reaction, and they wouldn't be able to avoid it. If that happened, they could end up with a Rhine-like scenario on every front. <clears throat> the Republican army on the Rhine lines was quite a handful. If it was only the Republic, though, they still had a chance of winning. But what would happen if some units from the Commonwealth showed up in order to support them? They could find themselves in the opposite of their current superior position. So long as it was doubtful the Imperial Navy could stop the Commonwealth Navy if the remnants of the Republican Navy joined in, it would be all the Imperial fleet could do to protect itself, much less stage a landing. <clears throat> of course, they couldn't twiddle their thumbs for too long, either. If they waited to act, even the Empire would run out of steam. Then they would lose the strategic effects of having brought down Dacia and the Entente Alliance. And they couldn't bear the idea of being beaten from the side by the Commonwealth or some other interloping power. What can we do about this dilemma? Yet it was becoming clear that if they tolerated the current situation, anything that happened to affect the supply lines could spell disaster. That was their irritating predicament at present. Still, the founding of the nation, sorry, since the founding of the nation, the Great Reich had obtained its historical lands, had obtained its historical lands, but was also hounded by territorial conflicts. So there was never any lack of sparks for the next war. Hence their distress. No one was a simple, no one with a simple solution to the problem suffers. For better or worse, there were people present who knew the plan. <clears throat> Zatour knew. 
He knew that uh, he knew that all they had to do was not lose. Zator believed, to a rather surprising degree for a member of the military, that there was no need for them to go on the attack. Simply put, the status quo was fine. And Rudersdorf was also aware of it. He knew that there was no need for them to make serious attacks on the trenches. Unlike Zator, however, he couldn't accept the notion that this situation of attritional warfare was fine. He had the lucid determination of a soldier. If they could control losses and win, then why not do that? They finally both made up their minds and received permission to speak. I feel that we should change the way we are looking at this problem. Satur didn't consider himself timid, but given the significance of what he was about to say, even he was nervous. There was just a hint of stiffness in his voice, too small for almost anyone else to pick up, but he spoke as calmly as possible. His secret plan to disentangle these snarled up threads in one blow would be gory. The Gordian knot is just a story. A sharp sword is sharp, no matter who it is cutting. With our, existence, with our existing doctrine and values, we probably won't make it. We need a paradigm shift. Achieving victory by attacking the enemy castle and forcing them to sign a capitulation was now impossible. It would be difficult to man, and it would be difficult to demand a full surrender outside of instances like the Empire and Dacia, or the Entente Alliance, where there was an overwhelming gap in national strength. Looking at the current terrible war, it seemed the bloodletting would have to continue until one or the other of the powers couldn't take it anymore. Don't aim for victory, but instead avoid defeat. If we don't do that, it will be too hard to be the last one standing. General von Zatur, you mean you oppose the offensive? A member of operations asked him, perplexed. That was as far as their thinking went. No, that was probably common sense. To them, the offensive was how they would overcome and trample the enemy and thus end the war. But they were wrong. No, I support the offensive as such, but I do think we should modify its operational aims change its aims? Go on. No, no, stop. The question could mean both of those things, and Zatur answered by dropping a bomb in plain terms. The goal of the operation should not be to break through. It should be to bleed the enemy. To put it in another way, our offensive plan should be to wear out as many enemy soldiers as humanly possible. Conclusion. Exhaust the enemy. We carry out a thorough bloodletting and crush the enemy's ability to continue fighting. Degrichov's remark. <laughs> he could still remember each and every word the young soldier said to him in the War College library. The shock of hearing her speak so dispassionately about such a horrible world was hard to forget. And now that everything was progressing just as she had predicted, he was even more surprised. How much did that girl Degrichov predict? How could she have known? Predicting the future of a war is extremely difficult. The only constant rule is that common sense can change in an instant, and a new principle of war can conquer the battlefield. There aren't many soldiers who can adapt to those changes, so to think there is one who can predict them is, uh, is astronomically astounding, to be frank. In other words, we bleed the enemy until they collapse. This is the one and only way to resolve this. Someone unconsciously shifted, and the creak of the chair sounded extra loud in the quiet room. It was completely silent. Zatur was actually feeling calm in the face of it. No, strictly speaking, he was sympathizing with Degrichov. He sensed now that she had been able to speak so calmly back in the library because she understood. She understood the cost of breaking through that she sorry, she understood the cost of breaking through would be too high. Even if they could pull it off, their losses would be extremely heavy. And if the Commonwealth, anxious about the deteriorating war situation, decided to intervene, they would be pushed right back. 
that would be the worst possible outcome for the Empire. <clears throat> if they shed all of that blood, not for nothing, but a push in the wrong direction, the soldiers' will to fight would crumble. I couldn't send men in that condition back to break through again, at least, giving that order would only lead to more waste. So why not let the enemy make that mistake instead? We'll just wait for the Republic to drown in their own blood, and then march on Paris, and then march on Paris. Satur believed that this was the only viable option for the Imperial Army. In other words, war is ultimately about not heroes or the expression of chivalry, but how efficiently you can kill your enemies. To put it another way, it was inevitable that this conflict would become a total war. So, we shall thoroughly pummel enemy soldiers and their supply lines. I ask that we draw up an offensive plan with those aims, and that it is all I wish to say at this time. Surely, almost definitively, our future has been decided. The frozen expressions on the faces of his colleagues and subordinates spoke to that. You're crazy, they said. The operation he proposed was the opposite of almost anyone's idea of common sense. Leave parts of their territory undefended and prioritize wiping out the enemy's field army. And finish them off with a revolving door? You would have the army that exists to defend the fatherland carry out this sort of operation. No one could help but think these things. But sooner or later, the staffers sitting there would understand. There was no other path. He didn't know when, but he knew they would come around to the plan for its military merit. In every way except emotionally. I agree. Clearly, we should focus on annihilating the enemy's field army. Despite the other's hesitation, Rudersdorf made a clear declaration of his strong support for Zatur's idea. He was aware that posterity would judge them harshly, but he made up his mind then and there, and stated his position with confidence. It is a mad world where promising youths are pit against one another in battles to the death to see who can draw the most blood, and we are likely to carve our names into history as the ringleaders of this savagery. If that is the case, then let us at least improve the situation a little bit by putting an end to the war with our own hands. I have an idea. We advance. In other words, I believe the best plan is to escape forward. And therefore, he made a proposal that was devoid of rationality. Fight the war aiming not at territory, but at the army. <clears throat> oh God, why do you let these things happen? After vol vomiting up the contents of his stomach, including everything he'd eaten the night before, Major Se uh, Magic Second Lieutenant Warren Grants, uh, sorry, Warren Grants was lamenting to the heavens in the corner of his lodgings. Even the recollection of what he'd just experienced horrified him. I hit a Republican soldier whose name I didn't know over the head with my shovel and kept swinging like a madman. Then orders brought me back to reality, and soon after that, we were ordered to leave. I poured mana into my computation orb like my life depended on it so I could race across the sky for all I was worth. As soon as I took off, several machine guns began firing at me. I frantically formed my defensive shell and protective film. No matter what, I had to get away. With that on my mind, I forgot about support completely and made a break for it. That was when it happened. Whether by some trick of fate or the work of the devil, I saw the battalion commander climbing at a furious pace. Despite the dark veil of light, she was singing a hymn in an invigorating voice. The battalion commander. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, but I was scared she was escaping alone and would leave me behind, so I tried to follow her. I don't want to get left behind was what I was thinking when I started to ascend, but right at that moment... First Lieutenant Weiss seemed to come out of nowhere to grab my arm and pull me down. When we got back to base, he chewed me out. Why would you approach the commander while she's acting as our decoy? Are you insane? 
but if he hadn't saved me, I would have been turned into mincemeat like those other two guys who came to the front the same time as me. At the, sa at the time, all I was thinking about was getting back, so my memories before I made it onto a safe flight path are really hazy. Looking at the scenes recorded on my computation orb, I want to thank God I was somehow able to make it back from such a dense rain of fire. It was only a few seconds. The reactions of the pair from 7th Platoon were delayed by mere moments, but they paid for it with their lives. One careless moment, but it meant so much. The second I reached, uh, as the second I arrived at the rear base, the sensation of bashing someone's head returned to my hands and I felt sick. No, it wasn't just me. All the recruits felt the same way. The guilt. It was like I'd suddenly become an unpar It was like I'd suddenly become an unpardonable criminal. And right next to us and the worries tormenting us, the senior officers coolly began to interrogate the prisoners. Tell the truth. If you don't, my hand might slip. Relax. We follow the laws of war. If you fellows take the prisoner's oath, you'll have your rights. Don't worry. <laughs> We're not torturers. We are proper, sensible humans. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it that humans were capable of this. This battlefield. I had thought I understood that all manner of brutal, inhuman things would be done. I'm a soldier myself. I thought as long as I was in the military, I wouldn't hesitate to do my duty. Keyword being thought. But what was this? Was this a soldier's duty? What must be done to protect the fatherland? My duty? I couldn't stand the feeling. It was a strange sensation, like I was losing myself forever. I didn't want to remember my first my first time killing someone with my own bare hands. People die too easily on the battlefield. People you eat dinner with one night disappear by breakfast. In just a short time, I kill people and my friends get killed. The Rhine front is really, truly hell. The urge to run flitted across my mind, but then... The Bateman came to tell us breakfast was ready. Since we were at a rear base, as an officer, I had the right to use the provisional officer's mess. Put another way, I have to eat at the officer's mess. As I rinsed out my mouth and straightened out my uniform, the mirror reflected my haggard face. In just one day, I had transformed into a monster. I couldn't believe that it was me. Now I've seen war. Quietly. My inner thoughts slipped from my mouth on their own. Leaning on the sink, I just managed to hold back the rising nausea. And then I looked to the heavens. Really? How can everyone act so normal in this crazy world of war? That moment, I entered the officer's mess. The feeling intensified. It was crowded with the officers from my battalion. I heard the commander had eaten and was already at work and the officers were taking their time and chatting. Despite what had just taken place, I even heard laughter. Everyone was smiling and talking, relaxed. Something about the gap between the insanity suffocating the ba sorry, suffusing the battleground and this scene disgusted me. My bateman waited for me, and my food came out. But how could I possibly have an appetite under these circumstances? Even so, even so, I still had the habit I'd learned in my military career to force food down my throat if I had to. I used coffee to break up the hard biscuits and made myself eat them along with some bacon. There was no way the flavors would register, but I figured my body needed them to stay alive. So I swallowed them down. Humans have to eat, even at times like this. It is the same as forcing food down my throat when I was exhausted at the academy. That is what I told myself, but it took an awfully long time for me to finish my meal. Then I found myself heading to the small auditorium for the usual morning classroom session. My mentality was to follow orders due to force of habit from the drilled repetitions, again and again. Even times like this when I had no willpower, 
I was still a soldier at heart. Then I realized that I wanted to burst out laughing, maniacally. Wait a minute, what happened? I can laugh. It was a startling, refreshing discovery. I guess I didn't expect it because of my situation. Apparently, the human spirit is ridiculously resilient. Oh, I can't be late. I took so long to eat breakfast, even though soldiers praised for their unceasing vigilance are supposed to get that over with quickly. As a result, I had no time to lose that morning. If I stood around lost in thought, I wouldn't make it to the lecture on time. When I realized what time it was, I dashed off down the hall. Magic Second Lieutenant Grant's coming in. Grant's? Sure, come on in. But when I got there, the desks were empty, aside from a few company commanders and key officers giving me puzzled looks. Am I too late? The worry flittered across my mind, but when I look at the clock on the wall, I had just made it five minutes early. Thank God. Everyone was supposed to be there by that time. Normally, I would never be the only one rushing over here. What is it? You guys are supposed to have today off. Lieutenant Weiss must have understood why I was confused, and I finally realized after he said something. Sir, um, embarrassingly enough, I thought we had class today. I guess the shock from last night was so great that nothing they told us registered. Wincing, Lieutenant Weiss explained that after we got back, we'd been granted leave. With my head full of other things, I had forgotten... Uh, sorry, I had gotten up unsteadily this morning, but apparently they thought I was taking my time with breakfast to enjoy it. In other words, the superior officers figured I was having a relaxing breakfast on my day off, so they didn't check on me. I should have realized sooner. I'm sorry, sir. What for? You're fine. But while you're here, tell me what you thought of the raid, said Lieutenant Vice, pointing to a seat. The other officers didn't seem to mind, so I decided to join them. Well, it was a good opportunity. You reap what you sow, after all. Honestly, I was in a trance. Before I knew it, I was back at base. I didn't want to die, so I had been completely absorbed in taking action. If you ask me what I actually did, though, my memories are somewhat hazy. It was embarrassing, but I was honest with them. Yeah, that's how it goes, I suppose, your first time. Well, nice job making it back, though. With that as your first combat experience, your next one should be a lot easier. But the officers didn't really seem to blame me. At the academy, I would have gotten chewed out. Keep your head screwed out on out there, recruit. On the front lines, though, they're more realistic. They recognized that I had survived, and that that was a start. They were actually nice to me, as if being considerate were the norm. Everyone has to run the gauntlet here. Well, if you survive the commander's training, consider yourself more or less fine. Lieutenant Serebriakov toughened up just by flying after her. Well, yes, that's true. Would anyone like to trade with me? <laughs> I'm second in command, so I can't fly with her. It wouldn't do for company commanders to bunch up, so unfortunately, the reality of my duties prevents me from trading with you, Lieutenant. It really is too bad, Lieutenant Serebriakov puffed out her cheeks and pouted as if she were really fuming. <laughs> The collection of individuals here creating this peaceful atmosphere were the old stagers who had been working so furiously the other day. I suddenly felt like I might sigh out of relief. Up until just a moment ago, I was so shaken, but I was starting to calm down a little bit. Nobody said so, but I'm sure they had all been upset the first time they had shot and killed someone. But now they had those memories and they aren't upset by them. Don't think too hard about it, Lieutenant. Just focus on staying alive. Someone patted me on the shoulder, and they let me go. It was proof that the more experienced officers accepted me as a little bit tougher than a chick newly hatched. The next day. <clears throat> to Tanya, everything is going too well. For starters, when she wakes up, breakfast and coffee are already neatly prepared for her. There are no harassing bombers and no enemies wandering into their airspace. So after eating in peace, 
her first administrative tasks of the day go smoothly, awfully smoothly. A request that would normally take weeks to fulfill gets accepted in one try, and the supplies are delivered right away. How horrifying can it get? Parsimony is the supply officer's job, but he hands over the special bullets for loading with interference formulas and the casting detonators with a smile. Meeting a grinning debt collector or auditor would feel more real. No, actually, they are all unthinkable. <clears throat> this is the first time everything has gone according to procedure. I never would have imagined that supply delivery and paperwork inspection could be done so amiably. Thoroughly astonished, Tanya has no choice but to be on guard at this unexpected efficiency. After all, supply and paperwork inspections operate on the iron rules of precedent and not rocking the boat. In other words, you can practically describe them as a naturally occurring phenomena. If they are acting unusual, it has to be a sign of abnormal conditions. I guess I should avoid going out for a while. If I don't have to, at least, Tanya thinks. She's not adverse to she is not averse to preparing for any eventuality. Today is definitely going to be trouble. I can feel it. Convinced of this, Tanya steals herself. She will give strict orders to the troops in the trenches to be on their guard. She shall have her unit at combat readiness level 2. She will keep an eye on the enemy and make preparations to ensure a rapid response is possible. Then, for some reason, nothing has happened and it's already lunchtime. Food is served. It's a real steak and sauerkraut this time. There's even rhubarb juice for dessert. Oh, I love rhubarb. Mm. It's all just arrived via the unusually smooth-running supply lines. The members of her unit all dig in enthusiastically, but she still can't believe it and inspects the food a bit before eating. I'm jealous of the guy who struck gold with that potato condition and got to fall back to a safe area. I'm wondering if they want to send me to the rear ahead, oh, sorry, me to the rear already due to the nudge I may have been giving that I may have given f for ugh, fuck. I am wondering if they want to send me to the rear already due to the nudge I may have been I may have given foreign policy regarding the Commonwealth. If I got food poisoning, they'd happily sacrifice me, so I can't be careless about getting sick. Of course, watching my subordinates wolf down the meat is torture. Being the only one who has to wait it is sad. Indescribably so if it turns out nothing's wrong. I can't stand it anymore. Reluctantly balancing reason with desire, I am about to start on my meat, and then that's when it happens. Lieutenant Vice comes running over with a telegram, and Tanya ends up missing her chance to eat. Major, it's from command. With no choice but to lay down her knife and fork to exchange salutes, Tanya is, at, is the very definition of displeased. If he weren't so sensible, I'd throw him out right now. At least read the situation. It had better be awfully important if you're obstructing my one and only opportunity to have a fine meal on the front lines where we have almost nothing to look forward to. Unbelievably outraged, she can't help but reply grouchily, though she knows it's an emotional reaction. I'm eating, Lieutenant Vice. Her tone doesn't veer into criticism, but her discontent is faintly audible. Most subordinates would hesitate if their superior spoke to them in such a voice. No one wants to incur their boss's wrath, but in unusual circumstances they don't yield, and with good reason. As it happens, this is one of those rare situations. My apologies, ma'am, but it's urgent. And from the fact that he presents not a message tube, but simply a short cipher, she smells trouble. Hmm, what's this? It's not orders? Usually, orders come by telegraph. As long as it's addressed to the commander, no one can read it before them except for the radio operator. So short ciphers are used when it doesn't need to be telegrammed or can't be. Basically, it's going to be either stupid or utterly annoying and stupid. No, you've been summoned to appear immediately. 
Summoned to peer immediately, you say, eh? Understood. Ugh. What a goddamn horrible day. Sorry, ugh. What a day. It's going to be horrible. And thus ends chapter 5. Chapter 6, Ordeal by Fire, is next. I must admit my throat is rather sore, having read this all in one cut with no edits. <laughs> this is quite a long chapter. In any case, this is also likely to be the final or second to last chapter that I am actually able to read for the next foreseeable amount of time, as I am leaving for Tokyo on a flight in all of two days or less. So, yes, given the amount of time required for recording and editing, as well as my other um, my other commitments, this is, again, likely to be my final chapter for some time until I return in approximately a month from now. In any case, thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, wherever you may be. Auf Wiedersehen. All voices and animations were created by myself, namely Daniel Howard Hurt. The original story credit goes to Carlo Zen, and the original light novel art was created by Shinobu Shinotsuki. Thank you for joining us. Auf Wiedersehen.